We owned property up in northern Idaho, where my family would naturally farm potatoes. Yes, I know, it's cliché. We owned a couple hundred acres with little to no people nearby. Growing up, I've only seen three people drive by our farm. One was our neighbor looking for his lost horse, and the other two were college kids that got lost on their way to Canada. With our farm being so large, we have random sets of barns to house fuel and other machinery on and around the farm. In all, we had about five barns or so around the farm, and we were told to always keep the barn doors closed. I somewhat laughed at this idea since nothing was out here but random deer and coyotes. I remembered one summer my sister had left the barn door open, and we had issues with raccoons for the rest of the year. I was the second oldest and was responsible for harvesting crops and storing them in the barns, while my father would go barn to barn, collecting the harvest for the year. Like I said, I was the second oldest. My older brother Trevor died when I was young in a tragic accident with one of the tractors. I was only 10 at the time, and he was 17. I remember my father coming in late one night covered in blood, crying with my mother. Apparently my brother left the tractor in neutral, and the tractor rolled on top of him, crushing him. My father went to look for him when he didn't show up for dinner. My father was never the same after that night, and neither was the family. Instead of being able to drive at 14 like my brother, I had to wait until I was 18 to drive one of those tractors. That was only because my father was running low on help, and I actually had to talk him into it for four years. I would like to go harvesting, either in the mornings or late at night when the air was cool since our tractors were old and did not have air conditioning. My father would stay up late until I had come home from those late nights of harvesting crops. He would never go to bed until I would come in. During those nights of harvesting, I would see some interesting sights, some of which were haunting. I remember one night, I accidentally ran over a small deer that was laying in the tall crops. It was quite gruesome and caught me off guard. Blood went everywhere and I had to clean the tractor for 30 minutes the next day. Another time, I saw the remains of what looked like a calf that was eaten by wolves on my way back from a harvest. Normally, something like this doesn't faze me at all, but coming in at 2 a.m. for late harvest was a bit spooky. The barn nearest the house was a brisk 15-minute walk, and after seeing that and making that walk with nothing but the moonlight to guide you, it was sure to send a shiver down your spine. Something happened one night, something I never did tell my dad, but I think I saw something imitate my dead brother. Not like another person, but a creature. Something intelligent, but evil. So here's what happened. Like I said before, we were always told to keep the doors closed on the barns on the property. Well, I began to get lazy the later my harvest got, and the closer the barn was to the house, the more likely I figured that no one or nothing too deadly would try to stay in our barns that we couldn't remove on our own. It wasn't that big of a deal, but keeping the door open would save me from having to hop out of the tractor and opening the somewhat heavy barn door. It would literally save me less than a minute of time, but... Coming in late after spending hours of harvesting late at night would make a huge difference in my teenage mind. The day started off like any other, and school dragged on like it normally did. I was driving home from school not really paying attention to the road when I noticed something in the corner of my eye. As I slowed down, I noticed a large, hairy animal quickly dart across the road. It looked like a wolf, but it was standing up on two legs. It ran as if it was wounded, but it moved so fast. Impossibly fast. As quickly as the creature entered my view, it left, only leaving a small trail of dust in its path. The direction the creature was running, it would eventually reach my family's farm in the next three miles or so. But the likelihood that the thing continued straight was extremely unlikely. The rest of the drive home I was freaked out, mainly because I almost crashed my car butt. Also, I've never seen anything that big move that fast in this area. I remember one summer I went to visit my uncle in Alaska, and we went and hunted moose. It kind of reminded me of that in terms of the size, but the speed was unlike anything I'd ever seen. I arrived home and the creature seemed to escape my mind when I saw my mother had cooked my favorite pie. 
after two slices of pie and a tall glass of milk and some Jets versus Patriots on ESPN, I was ready to get my chores done on the farm. I got old Betsy, aka the rusty green tractor, and got it fired up. I began my route to harvest the potatoes, leaving the barn door opened. The tractor was equipped with these old headlights that I used to see ahead about 30 feet or so. For the most part, they were terrible, but considering that there was nothing for me to hit in these fields, I was in good hands, even though it was so dark. I was about halfway through my route when I began to smell this terrible smell. It smelled much like the deer I hit with the tractor, but much worse. It kind of smelled like a burnt metal smell, if that makes any sense. For a moment, I thought old Betsy needed a new belt, but we just replaced one last year. They typically last for five years easy. I made sure to keep my eyes opened as I continued driving in the endless fields that laid ahead of me. My biggest concern, honestly, was having a breakdown in the middle of the field. If that were to happen, then it'd take me about an hour or so to get back. Thankfully, the tractor didn't break down, and I continued my route. I was working my way back when the tractor's lights briefly scanned across the open field, and I saw something. Something large, moving quickly. Just barely out of the reach of the lights to properly identify it. I was heading for the barn that I foolishly left open. My mind raced back to earlier in the day when I saw that creature. It looked like somehow it ended up on my farm. Luckily, I was in Betsy, which was near impossible to enter while I was driving. Unfortunately, I did have to park it inside the barn I left open, and would have to take that 15-minute walk back to the house with nothing to protect me. I sheepishly drove back to the barn, and after a few hours of collecting potatoes, the smell of burnt metal was incredibly strong. I began to feel this intense feeling of evil in the air. I pulled up to the barn, and instead of seeing the barn door being wide open, I saw that it was slightly ajar as if someone had moved it. This forced me to get out of the tractor, which I did, and I opened it all the way. The lights of the tractor illuminated the barn. Our barns were a mess and had tools and parts laying around. It wouldn't be too difficult to hide if you really wanted to. I made sure to double-check the barn, although inside the tractor, just to make sure nothing got me. After looking for about five minutes or so, I turned off the key to the tractor, which also turned off my light source from inside the barn. Thankfully, the moon was out, and it was able to cast some light inside. I exited the tractor and made sure to refuel the tractor before I left. As I was returning the empty fuel can, I heard my name, although it was completely distorted. It sounded like someone was speaking to me with damaged lungs, like a very raspy voice, like they'd been smoking for 50 years or something. My first thought was that it was a hobo that had entered the barn, but then I realized that the voice was calling my name. How did it know my name? I then thought that my father was out in the barn trying to scare me. It wouldn't be the first time that my father gave me a good scare, but it was very light for someone to pull a prank like this. I was able to catch a small glimpse of something that looked tall and hairy in the corner of the barn. I immediately turned tail and ran towards my home. This was a ridiculous endeavor. I was in no shape to be outrunning anything, let alone whatever I saw earlier, running at those speeds. I heard what sounded like a large animal thrashing around the barn and hot on my trail. I was halfway back to the house when I heard what sounded like my dead brother, calling me by my nickname that no one ever called me but him. I stupidly turned around to see the outline of my brother, but he looked like he'd been hit by a car. His neck and limbs were all bent, and pieces of flesh were hanging off of him. It was hard to tell exactly what I was looking at, since I felt like I was going to die from all the running, and the thought of a large creature trying to kill me. I knew whatever it was trying to pretend it to be my brother. Must have had something to do with his death. How did it know what he looked like? How did he know my nickname? That only my brother called me. I continued running and made it back to the house. The entire time I could hear breathe behind me. I made the 15-minute walk into a 5-minute run. I no longer harvest at night, and I now have questions about how that creature knew so much about my brother to be able to intimidate him like that. Regardless, I felt lucky to be alive, and yes, I no longer leave. The barn door opened.
I remember my summers being so full of joy and filled with excitement. Something would happen one summer that would leave my family in shock, which we would never recover from, and we would never speak of again. My cousin Stephen was practically the same age, and we joked that we were more like twins than we were cousins, considering that we were born in the same year. Our families were inseparable, and we would often spend vacations and holidays together. Stephen's mother, aka my Aunt Linda, was my mom's sister, who had a tragic accident when she was 12, when someone had hit her with a car while she was riding her bike, leaving her paralyzed from the waist down. Aunt Linda was always a bubbly source of fun and excitement, and would never let her condition come in the way of having a good time. My Uncle Jackson, or Uncle Jack as I called him, was practically my favorite uncle, who was always down for doing something crazy and fun. It seemed that every family has that one family member that takes things to the next level of craziness. That was Uncle Jack. One year, when I was 15, my entire family decided to go camping down in southern Utah, near one of those national parks for a family reunion. I had many other cousins, but I wasn't nearly as close to them since they were all different ages and lived so far away from us. Naturally, I spent most of my time with Stephen and his parents since I knew them the best, but also, they had a really nice RV which was adapted to Aunt Linda's needs. Camping with them was more like staying in a small but nice hotel with a shower and bathroom, as well as a TV. Our first night down in Utah was your typical first day at a family reunion. Everyone was excited to see everyone, and we set up our camping stop in an unusual location which everyone thought was odd. Apparently, another uncle, Uncle Darren, had a buddy that had a ranch down there, and he let us stay on the outskirts of his property for free. I guess we figured that this would be better than staying at a crowded campsite. Get more of the full experience kind of thing. My family was known to being somewhat thrifty, so we did this kind of stuff all the time to get a good deal on something. The campsite was nothing special. We could see all types of cattle roaming around not too far from us, but free was free. I remember telling Stephen that one night we need to sneak out and go cow tipping. Stephen and I were always doing silly stuff that teenage boys do. Stephen responded with a wide, mischievous smile. The first day had ended and everyone gathered around a central campfire to have a dinner and talk. As the night grew dark and all the little cousins went to bed, the rest of the family began to tell scary stories, which was a family tradition. My dad always told the golden arm story while my grandpa would always come up from behind and scream, Where's my golden arm? at every camp trip without fail. Even when I was expecting it this time, it still kind of scared me. The fire had died down low, but the coals were still red hot. The moon fully lit the flat land around us and we could hear cattle off in the distance. Uncle Darren, the uncle who had the buddy whose land we were staying on, shared us an exceptionally scary story. A story I wish I took seriously and took as a word of caution, rather than something that would never happen. He shared with us a few accounts of what his buddy said had happened on the land over the span of 20 years. I can't name them by name, but there is some type of force out here that's evil, that lurks in the darkness of this land. If I name them, then I risk drawing them to us and devouring our bodies. Uncle Darren said dramatically, being 15, my eyes were wide with fear as he shared these stories of these people that had these abilities to shapeshift into any type of animal and mimic people. He shared an especially terrifying account of a creature that had stalked campers that left the campsite and wore their skin to attract others to a similar demise. These stories were so terrifying that I reconsidered my desire to go cow tipping, let alone stay the rest of the trip on this land. The fire ended up dying 30 minutes later, and we were left in the light of the moon. Many of my cousins and family members were already in their bed or on their way. I got up to make my way back to the RV when Stephen asked me excitedly if I was ready to go tip an unsuspecting cow over. I was terrified from the stories told by my Uncle Darren, but I didn't want to look silly to Stephen. Uh, sure, sounds fun, I said lying. We already had the flashlight, so we drifted off to where no one could see us. We came across a barbed wire fence that seemed oddly secure for your typical type of cattle. 
There must have been issues in the past with coyotes and other predators getting to the cattle, I thought. In the back of my mind, I was thinking about those creatures that could mimic people. We ended up finding a gap just big enough that we could squeeze through, as long as someone held the tension of the top barbed wire. We shined our lights around the empty dry field in hopes to find a cow, but... But they were all in small herds a good distance away. We turned off our lights in hopes to better improve our stealth. The moon was now somewhat concealed by clouds above, and the land was now more difficult to traverse in the darker settings. Around this time, I began to feel this feeling I've never felt before. A feeling of exposure and dread. A feeling that nothing ever has ever come close to. I think that Stephen felt this as well as he seemed to be looking around. We continued a little further when we saw a dark mass ahead of us that seemed to be crouched over something. We could hear slurping sounds coming from the crouched figure ahead. The feeling began to get worse when we heard a screech directly behind us, which made me and Steven jump and drop our flashlights. I remember Steven screaming something vulgar and hearing laughter coming from where we heard the scream. We then saw a flashlight and Uncle Jack fall over in laughter. Me and Steven were busted, and thankfully Uncle Jack was the one that found us, although at our expense. We turned around to see the small figure that was hunched over, but it was gone. The feeling of dread had dissipated. We walked over to where the figure was standing, and laying in pieces was a small calf that looked eviscerated. There was a number of natural predators in the area, but my mind went back to that story of the shape-shifting creature that stalked this land. Even though we were there with Uncle Jack, we still felt unsafe. We needed to leave immediately before that thing came back to us. We walked back to the campsite where our families had set up camp, although the presence of something malicious still lingered in the air. Like thick cobwebs. The feeling for some reason seemed to have followed us, and I was unable to shake it. Thankfully, Uncle Jack and Steven were with me, and we all had flashlights. This is the part of the story where I wish I told everyone what we saw, what we felt, and that we needed to leave, but the vacation just started. We weren't going to let a ghost story and a close call with the creature in the woods ruin our whole trip. The rest of the week was odd. The campsite lingered with that feeling of something nearby watching us. I remember a few nights hearing the sound of something scraping the RV door with something sharp, as if something was trying to get in. I was too afraid to check it for myself, so I just shorted off as the wind. During the day, things seemed normal, but the nighttime seemed to put people on edge. Everyone wanted to go to bed early, as if they were trying to avoid something. The last night that we were there, something happened. We were all cooking around the campfire like we normally did, but we stayed up later than normal. I guess we all wanted to get the full experience before we had to go back to our normal boring lives. We were all around the campfire telling stories, and the night was absolutely black. The moon was absent, and the only light that we had was coming from the campfire. Uncle Darren shared with us another story about the property that really put me on edge. But during this story, I couldn't stop looking around in the woods behind us. It was as if the stories about the creature that terrorized the property seemed to be drawn to us. I went to bed soon since the stories and the dark atmosphere really made me feel exposed in the woods. Others could feel it as well since everyone seemed to call it a night. Uncle Jack, Aunt Linda, and Stephen came into the camper not much later, and I peeked up from the couch to greet them, but they seemed frightened by something. Something that was outside. Aunt Linda was trying to peer out the windows of the RV while still in her wheelchair. Stephen went around the RV, locking all the entrances to prevent something from entering. Uncle Jack seemed skeptical about what was going on, saying, I'm telling you, it's just this guy messing with us, while searching the RV for a weapon. I asked about what was going on, but everyone seemed to ignore me due to the situation at hand. I was nervous since I didn't know what was going on, but Aunt Linda came over to me by rolling over to the couch saying that there was nothing to worry about and that someone was just walking outside of the campsite. This didn't help my nerves, but rather amplified them. Before I could respond, Uncle Jack found a baseball bat inside the RV and grabbed a flashlight and headed outside. Uncle Jack took off into the woods, shining his flashlight around as he did. It appeared that something bothered him enough to go out into the woods and confront whatever was out there. Stephen and I were waiting by the door for Uncle Jack to return, but he never did. 
We considered getting Aunt Linda when he wasn't back after two hours, but we didn't think that she'd be able to actually help that much, so we took it upon ourselves to find him. We opened the RV and went into the direction that we last saw Uncle Jack. We didn't walk that far into the woods before we saw a light that looked like it was shining from the ground. We walked over to the light on the ground to find that it was Uncle Jack's flashlight. Next to the flashlight, we saw small traces of blood leading deeper into the woods. We looked at each other in complete terror and knew almost instantly that something was wrong. But before we could say anything to each other, we heard a noise coming from the woods. We shined our lights to where we heard the sound and to our utter confusion, we saw Uncle Jack, but he was facing the woods still, standing, motionless. He was staring into the woods without his light. He can see something in the darkness. I whispered to Stephen as we stared at my uncle. Stephen was silent as we watched my uncle begin to slowly walk backwards to us without revealing his face. It was when Uncle Jack was within 20 yards of us or so that we noticed Uncle Jack's shirt and pants were both torn up and bloodied. It appeared that he must have confronted something dangerous out in the woods and barely lived, but he didn't turn around or even seem bothered that he was injured. Dad, are you okay? Stephen asked as he went to check on his father. Uncle Jack continued to face the forest and remained silent. Stephen then ran to him and embraced him as a sign of relief that it was indeed his father, but Uncle Jack seemed unfazed. Something was wrong. Why was Uncle Jack acting so strange? What happened to him and why wasn't he wanting us to see his face? I told both of them that we needed to get back to camp and both Stephen and his father followed me back to the RV. On the way back to the RV, Stephen had to help his father walk properly since he was walking as if his legs were broken, almost as if he'd never walked before. Stephen asked out of concern, Are you okay, Dad? What happened? But Uncle Jack would only respond with gurgling sounds and grunting. He must have been injured worse than we thought, and it sounded as if he had water in his lungs. Something must have punctured his lungs when whatever it was attacked him. We made it back to camp, and instead of keeping this to ourselves, we alerted everyone that Uncle Jack was injured. Everyone at camp came out of their tents groggily to see what the commotion was. By this time, Uncle Jack was able to walk by himself, as if he magically healed in the short amount of time it took us to get back to the campsite. Family members then started asking questions as to what had happened. Stephen and I were about to respond when Uncle Jack tried to speak. He was now able to sound more normal, but wasn't able to properly form his words, much like an infant that could make only sounds and had yet to properly formulate any words. One of my aunts, Aunt Jenny, who was a nurse, said that he probably was in shock, which is why he couldn't speak, and that we needed to get him to a doctor immediately. We were obviously in the middle of nowhere, and we would have to travel a good distance in order to accommodate this. My family began to delegate who should take him to the doctor when Uncle Jack began to speak. I... I fell. It had... His voice was beginning to sound more normal the more he spoke, but something was off. His face was without pain or emotion. This was wrong. Clearly something about this was all wrong, although the chaos of my family panicking made things all the more difficult. By the time we were able to figure out what was going on with Uncle Jack, he was able to speak clearly, and he seemed to be normal. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. I went out to find whatever it was that we saw during the campfire. I accidentally slid on some shale and hit my head on some rocks. His mannerisms were still off, but his speaking was normal again. Despite him seeming normal, my family still insisted that we went to get checked up at a hospital, just to make sure that he was okay. But he refused, strongly against it. He seemed fine enough and we called it a night. The whole event made me feel uncomfortable, and I decided to do something different. Instead of staying in the RV with Uncle Jack, I decided to stay with my parents in their tent. Something about the evening didn't add up, and I felt safer the more distance I put between me and Uncle Jack. The next morning is a day that will forever be scarred in my mind and in my family's lives. We all got up around nine or so and began packing. We made breakfast as a family, but Uncle Jack, Aunt Linda, and Stephen were all missing from breakfast. Aunt Jenny went to go check on Uncle Jack just to make sure that he was doing okay and went over to their RV. 
After knocking a few times, she tried the door, which was unlocked, and went inside. The next bit is fuzzy in memory, but I still remember her screams. Everyone at breakfast stopped what they were doing and glanced over to the RV where Aunt Jenny was still screaming. A few of my uncles and my father went to the RV and immediately exited while calling the police, escorting Jenny in the process. The police took an hour to arrive since we were in the middle of nowhere, and shortly after an ambulance came as well. At the time, I wasn't told anything, and I was left to wonder what was happening. Where was Stephen and his family? I would be told many years later by my dad what happened to them and what he saw that morning. He thought it was a cougar attack, but deep down I knew the truth behind what had happened. He told me that when he entered the RV, that the first thing that he noticed was the smell. The smell was awful and overpowered the senses. He then noticed the blood. Blood was everywhere from the walls to even the ceiling of the RV. The only thing that was left behind was my aunt's wheelchair. I used to play a lot of Xbox Live with my friends from work. I worked at a typical 9 to 5 job that paid well, but the job was boring. Playing Xbox gave us something to talk about, and when things got slow, that's what we did. This was back when Xbox One just came out, and my work friends and I loved it. My friends were a random group of guys, but they were fun to mess with, easy to spook. I had recently come across the concept of creepypastas online, and I loved reading them. My friend Jerry hated anything spooky, and I loved getting him worked up about all that stuff on Xbox Live. It got in his mind and made him jumpy. A part of me enjoyed looking up new scary stories to tell Jerry late at night while we played. I came across a new set of scary stories about these things called skinwalkers. Having just come across the concept, I wasn't exactly sure what skinwalkers were. Apparently, they had abilities to shapeshift into creatures and had abilities to also mimic the voices of past victims to lure new people to their deaths. Thinking or even saying the name Skinwalkers would lure them to you. This was perfect. When I would tell Jerry this, he wouldn't be able to sleep for a week. I read up on my stories and prepared my arsenal for Jerry. I was kind of an a-hole, I know. When the time came, I finally told Jerry about the Skinwalkers, and naturally he freaked out. He freaked out so much that he actually had to log off of Xbox early for being so scared. Me and the other guys were dying with laughter, just thinking about poor Jerry trying to sleep that night, checking his window every five minutes for these skinwalkers. We kept playing for another two hours and I finally had to log off and get ready for bed. As I was getting ready, I heard a sound outside by my car. My driveway was next to my room and this was annoying especially when people would pull into my driveway to do a U-turn. When people would do this, it would shine their car lights into my room. I figured it was just another random person doing a U-turn. I waited to see headlights, but they never came. Hmm, I felt spooked. Especially all that scary stuff I just told Jerry to scare him. I went and sheepishly looked out my window, but I didn't see anything. I didn't bother turning on my porch light considering I didn't want to risk seeing something I didn't want to see. I tried to go to bed but I kept hearing something outside. I felt stupid because I knew it was just me freaking out over these stupid scary stories I'd been reading. I then thought about what I'd been saying to Jerry. Just thinking or talking about them would be enough to draw them to you. I began to think, could this be true? I then heard another sound outside. This time I jumped out of my skin. This sounded as if something was just outside of my window. I couldn't ignore the sound. I crept as silently as I could to the front of my house and turned on my porch light. I peered out the front of my window and looked down to where I thought I heard the noises. My blood chilled as I saw four or five coyotes trying to look inside my bedroom. Some were leaning up against the window with their front paws while others were on all fours. Where I'm from, coyotes are somewhat common, but you never see them inside a town. Some of the coyotes looked rather normal, but others looked like roadkill, with fur and flesh hanging off of them. Instead of going out with my shotgun and shooting at them, I did the only thing I had courage to do, 
and press my truck's alarm button on the key fob. A loud siren went off while my truck's lights began to flash, better illuminating the creatures by my window. Thankfully this worked and the coyotes ran off. For a split second, however, with all the chaos of the truck alarm and all the coyotes running around, I could have sworn for a split second I saw one of the coyotes running, like a person, off into the night. In case you are wondering, coyotes are one of the common forms that skinwalkers take. Seeing five of them trying to peer into my window taught me a valuable lesson about what happens when you talk about them too much. Ever since then, I never spoke the word skinwalker out loud to anyone. My name is Jocelyn, and some people say I'm born with a gift, but it feels like a curse. I can see things mainly people who have passed on from this life that still wander this world, also known as ghosts. Some do not know that they are dead, while others are bound to places or to people for whatever reason. I see them quite frequently, and I try to ignore them. If they know that you can see them, they will bother you, but if you ignore them, they will go away. Despite my gift and all of my experiences, this isn't a ghost story, it's something much, much darker. All of my life I have learned to cope with my gift, and almost found a way to rid myself of such a burden. I grew up in the city and would see just as many spirits as I would people, which made my developing years very difficult. It wasn't until I was around 7 or 8 until I realized that these spirits weren't actually a part of my physical world. For years, I've been seeing people that specialize in such areas to help reduce my connectivity to the spirit realm and connect to other things, like nature. Nature has an effortless beauty that makes connecting to the world a pure experience. Me and my boyfriend moved into the country to better help get in touch with nature and to limit my connection with spirits that have passed. We moved to southern Idaho, just outside of a small town, about 10 years ago. The town was small, but had just enough of what we needed to live comfortably. During my time there, I maybe saw a handful of spirits that were just passing through, and I was able to lose most of my gift to see spirits. On the plus side to moving to Idaho, my boyfriend's family lives nearby. My boyfriend has two brothers, Riley and Caleb both of which he would consider outdoor people that liked their toys and to go camping whenever they could. They were both married to women that had very similar interests as us, making us natural friends, yet I didn't tell them about my gift. One brisk morning, we get a call from my boyfriend's brother, who lived down the street, saying that he wanted to take us out four-wheeling and go camping over the weekend. I was currently in between jobs, and my boyfriend had a very flexible job that made spontaneous trips like this possible. We would go camping all over, never in the same place twice. It was their family rule to always try something new, in order to live life to the fullest, or something. That's what they said, at least. This was fine, but it did make finding new places to camp somewhat difficult. I guess one of the brothers was able to find a place that looked perfect to ride dirt bikes when he was on a logging site that they ended up having to abandon for unknown reasons. We are giving coordinates to this camping site by one of the brothers. It's basically in the middle of nowhere. Riley tells us that he's able to get off work early and that he'll go and set up camp for us. We pack up and drive to where the coordinates take us and we arrive at this dirt road that leads us into this heavily wooded area. The coordinates that he gave us were very specific. Without them, we would not be able to find this trail since the Google Maps yielded us no results. I could see why a logging company would be interested in this area. As we drove down this dirt path, I began to feel uneasy, a feeling I haven't felt in some time. I sense as if I'm about to see a spirit, but I don't see anything. It has been many years since I've felt like this, so it catches me off guard. We can't stay here, I tell my boyfriend. I have a bad feeling. 
He stops driving and seems concerned. Can you see anything? He asks. I look around the area, trying to see where this feeling is coming from, but I can only see trees. Well, no, not exactly, I respond. He nods his head and says, Well, let's at least give this a try. Maybe the feeling will go away. The deeper we go into the woods, the feeling gets worse. I'm about to say something again, but we finally see Riley and Caleb's campsite. My boyfriend seems excited and pulls into the campsite next to their trucks that are hauling four-wheelers and dirt bikes. Upon arriving to the campsite, I see it. I can see a spirit of what seems to be an old man standing right next to our campsite. I immediately freeze as I'm reminded of my gift. It had been many years since I was able to see a spirit, so I was caught off guard, but I tried to play it off as no big deal. The old man's ghost is greatly disfigured. It looks as if it was mauled by some sort of animal that lived in the woods. I noticed the clothing of the spirit. It was somewhat modern, which told me that the spirit had recently passed away. The spirit of the old man didn't say anything. It just stood there, covered in blood, and put his finger to his lips, as if he wanted me to be quiet. As this happened, I was then greeted by my boyfriend's brothers, Riley and Caleb, as well as their wives. This brief distraction caused me to lose focus on the old man, and when I looked back to where he was standing, he was gone. In the past, when I would see spirits, I would do my best to ignore them. However, I was perplexed as to why the ghost wanted me to be quiet. I felt as if he was trying to warn me. The feeling of darkness seemed to lift ever so slightly, but still hung in the air like the smell of earth after a heavy rain. The sun was beginning to set, so my boyfriend asked me to help get her stuff set up. Hey Jocelyn, a little help with the tent? He said while messing with one of the temples. I walked over and debated on telling him what I saw, but I felt like if I did that, it would be ruining the trip for everyone. I swallowed my conflictions and decided that since the spirit of the old man was gone, that he would hopefully stay away. There was no need to worry anyone. Soon after we got the tent up, we walked over to the group who was surrounded by a cozy fire that illuminated a small cove of trees that it was under. The sun had not completely set, but the trees took away what little light it had to offer. In terms of seclusion and beauty, we had certainly found the perfect spot. The area was fairly damp due to a recent rain which made finding new firewood a bit of a task. Most of the trees nearby were green with life, so finding any dried up branches or fallen logs would require us to venture out of our small bubble of light and safety and into the darkness. Thankfully, Caleb was insightful enough to gather a small bundle of wood prior to us arriving. However, the bundle would not last us all night. The fire burned a bright glow that, combined with the pleasure of the company that surrounded it, melted the feelings of darkness and danger away. I was good friends with Riley and Caleb's wives, so we were able to hit it off rather easily. We hung out around the campfire, having a good time drinking beers, catching up since the last time we saw each other. The boys were busy inspecting the motorbikes that they towed along to make sure that they were ready for tomorrow. After what felt like a while, and perhaps too long, we finally came together to start cooking dinner. Thankfully, we brought a propane stove, but the fire was nearly dead. We assigned Riley to cook our burgers while we all went out to find more firewood. My boyfriend and I ventured off into the dark woods. I had a bright blue LED light that seemed to pierce the thick fog that hung in the air, providing a small cone of artificial light. The ground and the nearby trees were still wet from the rain earlier. This made finding firewood very difficult. We figured that the further we ventured, the higher chance we would find some dry wood. While we hiked, I decided to share what I saw earlier about the spirit of the old man. My boyfriend seemed shocked, since it had been years since I'd seen one. He probably thought that I'd lost the gift at this point. He stopped walking and looked at me. Jocelyn, are you going to be okay? What do you think the spirit wants? He asked. 
I told him I wasn't sure. I left out the part of the spirit telling me to be quiet. I figured it wasn't important. I told him I think I'll be fine, but I got a bad vibe from these woods. A light rain began to fall, as I was telling him, and we raced back to the campsite, empty-handed. We were the first to come back, other than Riley, who stayed back to cook. Riley welcomed us back, although he gave us a hard time for not bringing back any wood. The group slowly came back, one by one, with wet wood. Everyone except for Caleb. We didn't notice too much since we were trying to stoke the fire with wet wood. After we got the fire roaring again, we noticed that Caleb hadn't come back. We were about to start eating dinner without him when he finally returned. Caleb was one of those guys that was never afraid of anything. Or at least that's what he said. Something definitely spooked him out in the woods, because he could not stop looking over his shoulder, as if something was following him. When Caleb finally got back, we asked him, Caleb, what took you so long? You could tell he was conflicted with the answer he was about to give. He hesitated and waited, and then said, Uh, it's nothing. Most of the group disregarded what he said, but I didn't. I felt the same way. I felt uneasy. We finally then had dinner, which was delicious. Riley did a great job on cooking the food. As we had dinner and started talking, the bad feelings seemed to evaporate. Whatever made Caleb feel uneasy out in the woods was clearly not bothering him anymore. A couple of hours passed and we continued to have a good time. I don't know who it was, but someone suggested that we tell the scariest story that we know. Personally, I don't like scary stories, since I practically live one every day. Despite me not liking them, I did not object. We decided to go in order, giving each other enough time to think of a scary story. I started and I told some story about a golden arm or something that I heard when I was in girls camp many years ago. I didn't remember all the details and I think I botched the ending, but nonetheless, everyone seemed to enjoy it. We finally got around to Riley, who told us a scary story about skinwalkers. This instantly made me uneasy, since I believe in them. I believe in them to the point that I won't say their name. I think that it somehow draws them to you. As Riley was telling his story about, well, you know, I could tell that Caleb was looking around camp and over his shoulder. He was feeling uneasy again. Riley finally finished his story, which felt like forever, and everyone was on the edge of their seats. I think the mixture of the story, as well as the environment that we were in, made it extra scary. We finally decided to call it a night, around 1am. We wanted to get up early and ride dirt bikes. As we were going to bed, I couldn't help but notice that Caleb was shining his flashlight off into the woods, as if he was looking for someone. The night was difficult for me. I found that every sound out in the woods made me jump and I couldn't quite fall asleep. My sleep was disturbed throughout the night and I woke up exhausted. In the morning we started breakfast as usual. Everyone seemed to be exhausted from the lack of sleep, especially Caleb. I remember at one point Caleb asked, Did anyone else hear that sound off in the woods last night? It sounded as if someone was screaming. Everyone looked surprised, but no one can confirm that they heard the sound as well. Despite the events and our lack of sleep, we decided to stay and ride our dirt bikes throughout the forest. As I was eating breakfast, I could see the spirit of the old man again. He continued to put his finger to his lips, as if he wanted me to be quiet still. But, this time, he did something different. He finally spoke to me and said, it knows you're here. The spirit then disappeared. I sat in complete awe of what just happened. What was the spirit trying to warn me of? I finally come back to reality and I see that everyone is starting to put on their writing gear. Normally I'm all for writing, but considering the circumstances, I do not want to leave the camp. Thankfully, one of the brother's wives was a couple months pregnant, so it was the perfect excuse for me to stay back and keep her company. The group decides that they'll ride for a couple of hours, and then meet back up at noon for lunch. 
I stay back at camp and just keep an eye out the fire, as well as talking with one of the wives. Noon eventually rolls around, and everyone but Riley shows up for lunch. Knowing Riley, this was his typical behavior. He was a bit of a wild card. I ask if we should wait for him before we have lunch, but my boyfriend tells me that he probably found this awesome trail and that he's not hungry anyways. The group then eats lunch and leaves before Riley can return. No one seems to be worried about Riley, other than me. Later in the day as I'm sitting back at camp, I finally see Riley, but he's not riding his dirt bike. He's walking. I notice that his clothes are bloodied and tattered. Riley seems to be walking fine, but I notice that something is off about Riley. That bad feeling I felt earlier comes back ten times worse. Naturally, I'm concerned about Riley's condition since he seems bloodied. But, before I can say anything to him, the old man's spirit appears next to Riley, and Riley can see him. Riley doesn't say anything. He just stares at the old man and looks back at me. He puts his finger up to his lips and goes, Shh, before both of them disappear. It finally dawned on me what has happened. Something killed Riley in these woods, and he came back to warn me. The wife that stayed back that was pregnant was taking a nap, so I didn't want to bother her, and everyone else was out riding. The hours dragged on as I waited back at camp alone. I made sure to keep the fire going, and I collected enough wood to last us many nights. The group finally returned after what felt like a lifetime. I ran out to greet them and was going to tell my boyfriend what I saw, but to my surprise I saw Riley being assisted by my boyfriend as Riley struggled to walk normally. I immediately screamed to my boyfriend that he wasn't with Riley but with something else. Naturally my boyfriend was confused and stopped walking. He started walking towards me and asked, what did you say? Riley was now on the ground and he was convulsing. I ran up to my boyfriend and I whispered loudly in his ear, I saw Riley's spirit. He's dead. I don't know what that is. That isn't Riley. My boyfriend took a step back and asked me, Jocelyn, have you been drinking today? Before I could give an answer, the thing that was impersonating Riley started to shapeshift and let out a loud scream. The group began to immediately panic as they saw the horrors unfold in front of them. The creature began to look less like Riley, and more like an emaciated werewolf. Caleb was thankfully right next to his truck, and was able to go inside and pull out his shotgun. He let out three shots, but unfortunately were not effective at that range. The creature, for some reason, was particularly drawn to me, and started to charge at me. At this time, Caleb was able to close the gap, and was much closer. He let out two more shots, one of which hitting solid. A good chunk of flesh blew off the creature, and it was enough to scare it off into the woods. We were all left there in silence. We were completely stunned as to what just happened. Something was able to kill Riley, and even worse, was to take his form. Had his spirit not come back to me and tried to talk to me, I probably would not have noticed the difference. We obviously got out of there in record time. We called the police and told them what had happened. At first, the authorities thought that we were either on drugs or drinking. Granted, our story was rather out there, but nonetheless, it was the truth. The authorities finally believed us, at least enough to send out a search party, but we never did find Riley's body. We did find his new dirt bike, although it was mangled up pretty badly. As long as this story is, this unfortunately is not the end. Looking back, my boyfriend and I both think that, since he told us that story about skinwalkers, that he was targeted by one. We have made a promise to each other not to say the name. Life as we know it has never been the same after. We have missed Riley dearly, and, and I've started to have these really awful nightmares about that creature. My sleep pattern has gotten worse, and I've been told by my boyfriend that I start to sleep talk. The dreams have gotten so severe at certain points that I have woken myself up from screaming. Unfortunately, one night I was jolted awake by my boyfriend who was shaking me. He woke me up and said, Jocelyn, Jocelyn, do you know what you just said? 
I tried my best to wake up, but I was still dazed and confused. Jocelyn, you just said the word. You just said, Skinwalker. I could feel a heavy weight on my stomach as I realized what had just happened. I'd accidentally said Skinwalker in my sleep. Now only time will tell what will happen to me. Having seen the success of Operation Windigo, Agent Borsky was hand-selected for a special reclamation project named Dark Reach. For most of the materials of the operation, Dark Reach was considered classified since it was an ongoing operation, but some exceptions were made to fill in Agent Borsky. Long story short, a secret science base in the middle of nowhere had been compromised by unknown combatants. Agent Borsky sat skeptical when reading the mission briefing. How do we not know who the combatants are when it's a secret science lab? Surely we must have some idea of who these people are. The mission director was amused by Borsky's intellect and boldness. You're right, Borsky. We do have an idea with who is responsible, but nothing definitive. Since I have the clearance and the authority, I'm going to level with you. In 2009, our scientists made a breakthrough with time and space technology. They were able to create a portal to another dimension, or so we think. We have sent some people through with equipment, but the equipment is always immediately destroyed, and no one has ever returned from the portal. We think the conditions in the other dimension are too harsh for human life, so we took another approach. Borsky's eyes were wide with dismay. So who are the combatants taking over this lab? An advisor leaned over to the mission director and whispered something for a few seconds. The mission director nodded and said to the advisor, You're right, he deserves to know. Long story short, the director told Borsky that the only thing that they could think of that could survive difficult environments would be something that could shapeshift. They just so happened to have collected an asset from the National Park Skinwalker incident, and they used that to send through the portal. They're guessing that what has ever happened on the other side of the portal has caused the creature to adapt to this unearthly thing. We're going to send you in there and just make sure that the portal is turned off. It's a simple assignment, but you will have to go alone, and there will be no backup. Borsky was surprised by the no backup. Why don't I get any backup? The mission director responded and said, there's a good chance that whatever this thing is will manipulate your mind and shapeshift into your partner. That's why we have to send you alone. Borsky nodded and accepted the mission. They were able to give him gear needed for the mission, and they were able to relocate him out to the secret lab. The lab's entrance was well hidden, but also guarded by multiple people carrying machine guns. The lab looked like a door that was simply on the side of a hill. If there weren't any people there guarding it, he wouldn't have thought anything of it. Borsky was loaded with a machine gun, as well as wearing body armor just in case anything happened. One of the guards told him right before he entered not to talk to it. He took the advice and went inside. Upon entering the heavily sealed door, he could hear the latches close behind him, sealing him inside. He noticed that the power to the facility was off and that he was immersed in darkness. Thankfully, he had an LED light on the end of his rifle so he turned it on. He continued down the long hallway. He was thankful to see the red glow of emergency lights above. It must have been the backup power. Porsky was able to notice that the further he went into the science base, the more sticky the ground was beneath him. Not a great sign. There was no personnel left over in the lab, so he had to slowly make his way through on his own. Porsky's attention was at high alert. He was keeping his eyes peeled for that creature lurking in the darkness, but thankfully he saw no signs of it. He was hoping that he would just find the portal, shut it off, and get out of there without having to see or hopefully talk to that creature. That hope, however, was dashed when his flashlight caught something at the end of the hallway. Identify yourself, he shouted down the hallway, but no response. He slowly stepped closer and closer, hoping that one of the scientists were able to survive. Right before he was able to identify what he was looking at, the creature or thing bolted off to the left down a long hallway. 
Borsky tried to give chase, but was soon caught off guard when he looked down one of the hallways and saw a door glowing orange. Before he could walk down the hallway, he heard a voice in his mind. Adrian, I don't want to kill you. Adrian was Borsky's first name, which no one ever referred to him as. Adrian, you need to leave the portal alone. Humans need to suffer. Borsky responded out loud. You know I can't let you do that. I have to shut it off. Adrian slowly inched his way down the hallway while talking to this creature. The portal has shown me so much, Adrian. You should see as well. You know it will kill me. I can't do that. Adrian continued to step closer and closer to the door. The orange glow of the door got brighter. Borsky was about ten yards away from the door when his flashlight caught something at the end of the hall. Despite the figure being at the end of the hall, he knew immediately what it was. It was his mother, right before she'd gotten in a car crash. She was even wearing the outfit that he last saw her in. She didn't speak out loud, but in his mind. Adrian, dear, please don't do this. You can come back to me. The portal will send you back to me. His mother continued to step closer and closer, slowly down the hall. Borsky lowered his weapon just enough so he wasn't pointing his gun at her. Can it really send me back? Is it possible? He responded. Yes, yes, it most certainly can. Don't turn it off. The figure that looked like his mother was now close enough that he could see the features of her. Her skin looked bloated, her eyes were dark and black, her limbs looked twisted and out of place. The image of her was so repulsive that it immediately snapped Borsky back to reality. He immediately raised his rifle and began to fire. He unloaded his magazine into what was clearly not his mother. The creature immediately began to flail and scream while running down the hallway. Borsky made a dash for the room with the orange glow. Upon entering, he was able to see what was clearly a portal to another dimension, or at least what looked like one. Borsky was able to quickly discern what was the power source for this device, and immediately shut it down. Upon doing so, he quickly left the room and made his way back to the entrance. This would mean that he would have to go back into the hallway with that thing and make it all the way back. Borsky quickly left the room and sprinted back all the while hearing screams that were a mixture of his mother, as well as some feral beast. He stopped to look behind him and shined his flashlight, not seeing anything, but hearing the screams getting louder and louder. It sounded as if whatever it was was getting closer to him, but he couldn't see anything. To his complete horror, he was able to shine his flashlight up and see that the creature was crawling on the ceiling and the image of his dead mother. This was the most horrific sight he'd ever seen in his life. Borsky was completely stunned in fear. The creature then lunged at him before he could react and pinned him to the ground. Right before the creature was able to bite his throat, a jolt of electricity shocked the creature in the neck and it jumped back. Lights to the lab turned on and personnel filled the hallway. Multiple agents with weapons came out of the doors and were quickly able to subdue the skinwalker. Out of the crowd of agents came the mission director, smoking a cigar. Asian Borsky, you successfully completed the simulation. Congratulations. I live in northern Canada, in a somewhat small town where not much really happens. The town is surrounded by woods, and other than logging and mining, the town just had your typical industries. I was the town tow truck driver. Basically, I spent most of my time picking up stranded passerbys just driving through, or the occasional tow from the abandoned car at my bar. My job was pretty easy since I was never called to do repos, and I set my own raids. I lived in a small town where everyone knew everyone, so I kept my rates reasonable in order to keep my reputation in high praise. Since the town was small and I was a business owner, mostly everyone had my cell phone number and vice versa. This was neither a good thing nor bad, since I could call in a favor at any time, but they could do the same with me. I would get more calls than normal in the winter, since the snowfall was pretty intense. One night I'm at the bar, having a good time with the boys. There was a UFC fight on or something, so the bar was packed. 
I can normally get a decent meal at the bar for cheap since the bar owner is a good friend of mine and also my neighbor. It was winter time so my days were slightly more busy than usual, but I still only had to do three toes a day or so. I remember seeing a good friend of mine, Troy, at the bar. He was the town linesman, someone who worked on the power lines when they go down. He was the town's hero in the winter time with the occasional dead tree taking out a power line. Troy was a cool guy, in his late 20s and in very good shape. I'm in my early 40s, so I'm not able to drink as much as I once did. So when Troy offered me a beer and to stay and watch the fight, I had to decline. I ended up driving home before the fight even started, since I was tired and I didn't really care who won. I drove 15 minutes home on the snowy roads. Thankfully, my tow truck was built like a tank, and I hardly even noticed the snow at lower speeds. I get home and check my emails on my phone before going to bed. At 2 in the morning, I get a call from Troy. I normally don't answer the phone at these hours unless I have them saved as a contact. Having known Troy pretty well, I figured it must have been an emergency. I already knew the nature of the call before I answered the phone. He probably needs a tow. Hey man, sorry to bother you so late. No, you're good. I was still up. I lied. Well, driving home, I hit something with my truck, and it's totaled. I can't even get it to start. Oh, shoot, I said. Your nice work truck is totaled? What did you hit? I asked curiously. I don't know. It was some kind of deer thing. It ran off. I had seen Troy's work truck before. It was practically brand new and made to handle rough environments. It had a big brush guard on the front which should have destroyed any type of deer with little to no damage to the truck. He might have hit a moose which is far more heavier. Then again I don't know how fast he was going so things could change. Okay Troy, just send me a pin on Google Maps and I'll be there. I hop in my truck and get it started. Troy finally sends me a pin and I see that he's clear across town. My arrival time is 25 minutes. I start to drive and I get a call from Troy, except this time he's behaving, oddly. He seems jumpy and nervous. What's up, Troy? I'm on my way. Hey, there's something outside in the woods. I don't know what it is, but it's growling and it sounds big. I was going to stay in the truck, but the door would not stay closed. I have climbing equipment in the back, so I'm going to go find a tree and stay in there until you get here. Seeing that Troy is clearly scared... I do not tell him that bears are great climbers, but I do tell him that I'll be there in 20 minutes. He seems slightly at ease, but still on edge. He hangs up, but he calls me five minutes later. Hey, I saw it, he says in a hushed tone. You saw what? I saw it. It wasn't a deer. It was something acting like one. It has antlers, but walks like a human. I remember to earlier that evening that Troy was at the bar and probably had one too many, but he sounded sober on all the other phone calls. What do you mean it walks like a human? I asked. It's walking on two legs, he says. I have a flashback to when I was a kid. My grandparents would tell me to be aware of the evils that lurked in the woods at night. I always figured that these stories of beasts and demons that haunt the forest were to scare us into obeying our parents and to take care of the woods. I heard a snap of a tree branch on the other line of the phone, and Troy let out a terrifying sigh. <gasps> oh no! It sees me! Troy then hung up the phone. I was going much faster than I should have been on the dark and snowy roads, but I was generally worried for Troy's safety. I tried calling Troy, but he doesn't answer. This makes me more worried. I finally arrive and see his truck in the middle of the desolate road. The lights are on in the truck, but Troy isn't there. I stay in my truck and try calling again, but he doesn't answer. Normally I would just hitch up the truck and take off, but having heard what had happened on the phone, I assume that Troy is still in danger. I venture out of the truck and call his cell again. I can hear a faint ringing of a ringtone coming from up in a tree. I shine my flashlight around the treetops until I spot something red, hanging from the tree. I disregard any caution and walk in haste to the bottom of the tree to get a better look. And to my horror, I see what remains of a brutal attack on Troy. His limbs and head were removed. The only thing that remained 
was his eviscerated torso that was buckled up into the safety harness. The torso was still dripping and swaying ever so slightly. Having seen this unimaginable horror, I immediately run back to my truck and dial 911. I sit in my locked truck for what feels like an eternity, but after an hour, a single police cruiser finally shows up. I shake my head at the lack of response and exit my truck. I show the officer what remains of my friend Troy. The officer is also deeply disturbed about his remains. The officer calls in more backup, and we finally get a decent turnout. Three other police cruisers, an ambulance, and even a fire truck arrived on scene. The fire truck had to use their ladder to reach and to cut off the safety harness. I tell the officers what had happened, and their eyes get wide. Something about the creature having antlers and walking upright really seemed to cause great fear. I also tell them that he was at the bar earlier that evening, so he might have not been sober, and was probably seeing things. The official report, as well as the local newspaper, calls Troy's death the result of a vicious bear attack. So many things were wrong about this, and I still wonder to this day, what did Troy hit that night? on that dark road. I am a 23-year-old girl with quite the story to share. This happened when I was 15, and there will never be a day that goes by that I don't think about what had happened. First off, I am deaf. I can still hear some sounds, but they're extremely low and they're always muffled. I know ASL, American Sign Language, and I can talk although my words don't always come out sounding normal. I'm self-conscious about this, so I only speak to my family. Everyone else I mouth and sign when I communicate. At the time of this story, I didn't have a lot of friends. My father, who was an accountant for the mob, saw how poorly the books were being handled and saw that there were millions to be taken, that he could file away his taxes. He got away with it for years, until one year, the mob boss's wife, who was actually an accountant, that didn't want part of the family business, took a look at the books. My father caught wind of this and immediately turned to the FBI for protection. He became an informant and in return for his information, they placed my family in witness protection. They placed us out in Kansas, far away from the city, and had us take the identity as corn farmers. My mother was pretty disgusted by this. She's what country people call a city slicker. My mother grew up middle class and always had what she needed. She never had to see where the goods were farmed and made. My father was just glad to have protection, but he was still paranoid about the mob. He was always prepared to pack up and leave at any sight of trouble. His paranoia led him placing high quality cameras and a security system all around our home. We were all given these special necklaces, much like the ones you see in Life Alert commercials, that had a button to alert the security company. Rather than just having an alarm go off to alert my family, the security company also installed these very bright flashing lights in order to get my attention. Our home was literally next to this large cornfield out in the middle of nowhere. We wouldn't actually farm the corn, we just owned a lot and had farmers nearby drive their harvesters over to collect the corn. During the off-season, the same farmers would come and plant their seeds. The farmers offered to pay us for letting them use our lot, but my father always declined in hopes to have the farmers like us, so if the mob ever came through town asking for us, that they would have our backs. Now I've told you the backstory. Here's what happened. We had lived in the country for three years now. I had completely forgotten about my life back in the city, so when I saw a dark tinted car parked across the street, when I got off my school bus, I didn't pay it much mind. I figured it was someone that just got lost in the area, which occasionally happens. We live not too far from the highway, and if you get gas at the local gas station, it makes you drive on our road to get back to the main road that leads you to the highway. I go inside and lock the door behind me. My parents took new jobs recently since moving here, and it just so happened that both of them would be out of town this weekend. I finished up my homework for the weekend, which took about an hour, and went outside and jumped on the trampoline before it got too dark. The trampoline was next to the cornfield, which for some reason always made me uneasy. I was jumping on the trampoline when something most unusual happened. I felt this intense feeling of dread coming from the cornfield, 
The corn at this time was tall, thus I couldn't see who it was out there. Being somewhat spooked, I decided that this was enough time outside next to the creepy cornfield. I went inside just before dark and made myself a pizza. I set a timer on my phone with a vibrating alert, so I would know when the pizza was ready. For whatever reason, I happened to glance outside to see the car still parked. They probably broke down, I thought. My phone went off and I got my pizza out of the oven. I was in my room on my computer when something happened that had never happened before. The lights to the security system went off. This startled me and I hid under my bed. My phone then began to blow up with texts from both parents. They had this app on their phone that would allow them access to cameras in my home. One of the texts from my father said, Lisa, there's a man in the house. He is armed. I'm going to need you to climb out your window and go hide in the cornfield while I call the police. This text hit my stomach with the highest intensity of anxiety I had ever felt. My room was on the first floor, which was good and bad. Good that I didn't need to jump from a high height, but bad since it would be one of the first rooms the man will look in. I quickly grabbed my phone and exited my room through the window. I had no idea if I was being quiet. In my rush to leave my room, I probably alerted the man of my location, because right before I entered the cornfield, I looked back to see a man climbing out of my window after me. I disregarded my previous fears of the cornfield and bolted inside. The field was huge, and I ran quickly and sporadically in random directions in order to better hide. When I got a good distance to where I felt properly hidden, I laid on my stomach on the ground. I could see a flashlight in the distance combing the field. The light could barely be seen through all the corn, but I could tell that the light was getting closer. At this moment, I knew that I would eventually be found, but out of nowhere, I was beginning to smell this awful smell. I can't really describe it, but it was enough to distract me from my impending doom. I glanced up to see the light moving frantically, as if something was happening to the man. As I watched, the light fell. I lay there for 30 minutes until my father texted me that the police were at my home and that they were looking for me. I got up slowly and started walking in the direction of the fallen light. The closer I got, the more I could see blood splattered in the area. The corn in this area was greatly compressed and it looked like someone was dragged off. The amount of blood was significant. Whoever's blood it was, was probably dead. I didn't see a body though. Either the person made it out or something dragged it off into the night. I made my way through the cornfield and back to my house. I could see the police cruisers out in my driveway as well as the farmer that was supposed to check in on me. I walked into my home and surprised the police and the farmer. They had no idea where I was and figured the worst. I tried to tell them what had happened, but they couldn't understand me. I was panicking and I was probably sounding crazy. I was also signing while I was talking to the farmer. Then he remembered that I was deaf. He grabbed me a piece of paper and I wrote that the man came for me in the cornfield, but something took him away. I think the man died since there was a lot of blood. The police and the farmer were startled by this. I couldn't hear what they were saying but I could tell that the police wanted to go outside to the cornfield to investigate, but the farmer stopped them. I could only read a portion of what his mouth was saying, but he said that the cornfields were not safe at night. I went home with the farmer, and my parents came home the next day. The police were out in the cornfield investigating, and I could see them bring out parts of a body of what I assumed to be the intruder. My father eventually told me the reason he told me to go into the cornfield. It was because of the locals believed that there was a skinwalker that lived there at night. Apparently, they draw you in by calling your name or mimicking voices of your loved ones. He gambled on the fact that, since I was deaf, that I would ignore these voices and whoever followed me into the cornfield would be attacked rather than me. This obviously disturbed me because that was probably something very close to me that night, since I could smell it. It was probably trying to lure me away but saw my intruder and attacked him instead. It bothers me even more that the thing probably was trying to talk to me. We obviously moved from that home because it turned out the intruder was sent by the mob to kill us, but I also like to think it had something to do with what lived in that cornfield.
I grew up wealthy all my life because my family owned a fish processing plant in Alaska. Because of this, I would often visit up in Alaska in a private plane that my family owned in order to overlook the operation every couple of months. We recently hired on a new project manager, and unfortunately, he has been causing some issues recently, which required me to make my trips more frequently. On these trips, I was able to land on my family's private airstrip on our 300-acre land, which was next to our family cabin and air hangar. This may sound a bit eccentric, but when you fly as much as I do, in all honesty, I was probably saving money traveling this way rather than flying commercial. For the record, I have my pilot's license and have been flying since I was 18. That's one of the perks of being born in a family that is able to provide the necessary resources to fly at such a young age. During the time of this story, my plane was an older model that my father learned to fly on some time ago, and I was in the market for a new one. I had the money for a new plane, but I just got behind on some of my tasks, and I didn't have time to find a plane that could take the beatings that my trips would require. Needless to say that this caused me to exercise some unnecessary risk of flying a plane that should have been probably scrapped at this point. I got a call at 11 in the morning, and I was told that the project manager had no call to no showed for the past three days. I was obviously furious and had made arrangements to fire this recent hire and restart the hiring process. I was frustrated and knowing that I would have to restart the hiring process, which I really wasn't wanting to do since I'd have to do that in person. For reference, it was early winter, late fall, which made my travels all the more difficult. I try to avoid the Alaskan winters whenever I can, but due to the events at my factory, I was forced to be there. I got a forecast of the weather to see if it would be possible to land my aircraft at my personal landing strip, which would seem questionable. I would not be able to land my aircraft if there was any snow on the strip, but I was hoping that it was early enough in the season that snow has yet to fall. I spent the rest of the day getting preparations done on the aircraft and called a handful of plant managers, letting them know what plans I had in motion to finally find a solid candidate for the project manager position. I took off from the local airstrip that was 20 minutes from my house in California. I made my way to the Alaskan cabin that was about 7 hours away flight time. I had made this trip hundreds of times from since I was young to now. I even made this flight drunk a few times. Needless to say, I was confident in my abilities in landing this plane, even in an inch or two of snow. The flight dragged as it normally did. The sun crept across the sky and dipped behind the horizon just under an hour left of the flight. Normally, I don't fly in such short notice, but this was a business emergency. Unfortunately, this sense of emergency caused me to rush in my preparations and I was beginning to worry about the snow on the runway. I finally reached the cabin and I did a flyby to double check the area for snow. It looked like it just started to snow, but it looked landable. I was at a low enough altitude that I could have sworn I saw someone standing on my runway. I figured that this must have been a mistake and I had been flying too long. I wanted to double check, so I flew back again. The runway was cleared. I then came back again, extra slow, but my landing went better than it should have. Like I said, I had done it a million times, so a small amount of snow would not affect me. I stepped out of my aircraft and opened the hangar and pulled in my plane. The hangar next to my cabin is normally left unlocked due to it being out in the middle of nowhere. It was capable of being locked, but in the cold times like now, I preferred to leave it unlocked to make my time in the snow as small as possible. I pulled the plane in and made my way over to the cabin. Quick backstory about the cabin. The cabin was built by my father's grandpa. Obviously, I didn't meet him since he passed before I was born, but he was a real man's man. He originally built the cabin as a small hunting lodge to hunt moose and bears during the hunting season. That being said, we had wildlife everywhere. Bears were common, but they were always more afraid of you than you were of them. However, bears will never turn down an easy snack. Thus, keeping the cabin locked was essential. 
The nearest Walmart was about three hours away, which made stocking up the pantry an issue at times. It was always key to leave the pantry full on non-perishable food. That way, you would have some food when you'd come back next season. If a bear found its way inside, it could have plenty to eat. One thing we used was a bear mat, which was basically a piece of wood with nails inside of it, facing up, to prevent bears from coming in. You would place this board on top of your doormat, so if a bear stepped on it, it wouldn't want to come inside. This does sound cruel, but bears' paws are very rough and would only do enough damage to scare them off. I walked up to my cabin door, and to my surprise, the bear mat and most of my porch is covered in a black liquid. Blood, when dried or frozen, can appear to be black, but it still caught me off guard. I noticed on the door and windows black handprints. Did someone try to come into my cabin and step on my bear mat? I stood mystified outside in the snow for only a minute before the cold air snapped me out of it and ushered me inside. I quickly turned on all the lights and heat, still puzzled with what I saw. The bear mats would not have been able to penetrate most shoes due to the nails being too close together. Due to the displacement of weight, which means whoever stepped on my bear mat was extremely heavy, or was barefoot. I'm honestly surprised that a hiker would have somehow found my cabin, but even more so that whoever it was was barefoot. I was not able to shake the feeling that someone could still be nearby, like a dark cloud just hanging overhead. I did a quick walk around the cabin, and nothing seemed to be disturbed since I last visited. My anxiety slowly eased away, but not completely. All the doors were still locked as well as the windows, but I did see more black handprints on other windows. I was hoping whoever had done this was here a few months ago, not recently. This helped me come to the conclusion that I was somewhat safe in my cabin. I got situated and ready for bed since the next day I would be running around a good bit. The night was cold and the wind howled but nothing happened. I woke up early the next morning and got the day started. I was on my laptop for the first hour or two before I went out to the hangar. Out in the hangar, we have a truck that we leave there purposely for us to drive around. Whenever I leave, even if it's just in town, I make sure to put the bear mat back out. I drove into town, which is always a long drive, but this time it was beautiful with the sun slowly rising. The Alaskan wilderness always reminded me how beautiful Earth really was. I arrived into town just before noon and made my way into the processing plant. Once there, I felt the energy of my employees shift from horsing around to strict business. I could tell that they were used to goofing off while I wasn't there, which I really didn't mind as long as they got their stuff done. I did a quick tour of the plant and went from meeting to meeting before I left. I went into Walmart and bought a bunch of food I could heat up since I felt that I'd be there a while before I found a replacement project manager. I made the long drive home and at this time the sun had already set. My headlights illuminated only so much of the road since it was an older model truck. I made it home and I started to unload the groceries. The dried blood that I had yet to remove from the door reminded me of my unwelcome guest that was once here. I felt a small chill go down my spine, but I brushed it off. I finally unloaded and parked the truck inside the hangar, and while leaving, I contemplated locking the hangar. This is something I haven't done in a while, but with the black handprints on my door, my mind did wander. I ignored the thought and left the hangar unlocked. At this point, I realized that the snow had gained a few inches from when I left this morning. While walking inside, I half expected to see some animal tracks in the snow, but nothing. Just a clear blanket of fresh snow. I went inside and started a fire in the fireplace. The crackling of the burning wood added a calming background noise as the cabin began to warm. I hopped on my laptop looking at my emails for new candidates to hire for the position in the kitchen that was next to the window when I thought I saw something move outside. My heart skipped a beat. But then I realized it was just the flames of the fire that danced on the window. I went back to my laptop and before I knew it, I was up way too late. I let the fire die as I slept downstairs on the couch. 
I woke up in the middle of the night to a loud sound hitting the kitchen window. The sound not only woke me, but caused me to jump knocking over my laptop. More frustrated than I was scared, I picked up my laptop and placed it on the counter. I went to investigate the sound that woke me. At first glance, the window appeared to be normal, still having the black handprints I kept forgetting to remove. But something caught my eye. I noticed that there was a handprint that didn't fit in with the black ones. This handprint was red, and it was slowly dripping down the outside of the window. This handprint was fresh. My mind was still groggy from being torn from such a peaceful slumber, and I was not able to comprehend the meaning of this. A feeling of immense dread hit my stomach like a ton of bricks when I finally realized that someone was outside watching me sleep. I went upstairs to my nightstand, where I have a loaded 44 Magnum for any bears that might find their way inside. I went back downstairs and I turned on my porch lights. To my horror, the once fresh snow was now clearly disturbed and bloodied. It appeared that whoever was outside had circled my cabin and peered in multiple windows. My hands sweated as it gripped the rubber pistol grip. I was tempted to go outside, but the cold and my nerves got the best of me and I decided against it. I didn't get much sleep that night, but I eventually managed to get a few hours of sleep with my pistol nearby. I woke up in the morning later than normal due to the events prior and hurried through my morning ritual of getting ready. Once I went through my emails and had my coffee, I went outside to see that the freshly covered snow had covered the trail of my midnight watcher. I then looked at the windows and doors and decided that this was the time for me to clean them quickly with some paper towels and degreaser. The black marks were oddly thicker than I thought they would be. Blood isn't normally this thick. This was much more like tar of some kind. I quickly removed the marks and went over to my hangar to get my truck. The hangar, despite being unlocked, was undisturbed which pleasantly surprised me. I got in the truck and made my journey into town. During my drive, I couldn't stop thinking about the night before and how I felt so violated to have someone watch me sleep. What kind of person would want to watch me sleep out in the cold? Why were their hands bloodied? Did they try to come in and step on the bear mat again? This made me shiver at the thought of someone trying to enter with me sleeping right there. My day continued to pass slowly with the night always lingering in the back of my mind. The more I would dread it, the quicker it seemed to come. After an unproductive day of interviews, I went back to venture out to my lowly wilderness cabin that I now feared rather than embraced. I arrived home and I looked at the snow before pulling into the hangar to see if my night watcher had returned. The snow showed no signs of anything unusual, so I proceeded to the hangar. I exited the truck and instead of leaving the hangar unlocked, I decided to lock it. Whatever that was out here with me has gotten inside my head. I spent the night time upstairs rather than down in my kitchen. I wanted to remove any possibility of unwanted eyes watching me. The wind howled through the thick trees, which every now and again almost sounded like the screams of an angry beast. That night went on without a hitch, although my pistol stayed nearby. I woke up the next morning and looked outside to see that the snow had gained another foot or so, but thankfully remained undisturbed. A slight relief to my frantic mind assured me that Whatever was lingering around the cabin had surely left. I got distracted that morning trying to set up plans for more interviews, and I accidentally forgot to put the bear mat back in front of the door. I didn't realize this until I was halfway into the city, and I wasn't wanting to drive back just to move that mat a few feet. I figured that I would be okay and that most of the bears should have started hibernation by now. Work went by pretty quickly, and I had a good productive day. I had a few interviews that I felt good about, and I had some solid candidates on my hands. The big thing that I was looking for was experience and reliability. As much as I enjoyed coming up to Alaska, I wasn't wanting to be up here more than I needed to be. The day went by so well that I almost forgot about everything that had happened the nights before. 
I also forgot about not placing that bear mount back in front of the door. It wasn't until I pulled back up to the cabin that I realized that I made a huge mistake. I was startled to see that the lights in the cabin were on. Normally, I was pretty good at remembering to turn those off, but I'm not perfect. I pulled up to the porch area to see that my front door was wide open. I definitely didn't leave the door open. My pistol was left inside, but I thought ever so briefly that I'd be able to sneak in and grab it before searching the rest of the cabin. I exited my truck, leaving it still outside, and I slowly went inside. Thankfully, I left my pistol downstairs, which was not too difficult to get. I made sure that the gun was loaded, and I took the safety off. I then realized that there was a trail of blood leading from the door, heading to the upstairs. I slowly followed, gun in hand. While walking upstairs, I was able to hear these indescribable sounds. The sounds were so foreign to me that I was genuinely curious as to what was going on. I slowly reached my room, where the sounds were much more clear. I opened the door quickly to surprise whoever was in there, but when I opened my room, I was completely horrified at the sight that laid before me. It was too much for my mind to process at first. I didn't even know what I was looking at, but there was a human-like creature eating a small moose on the ground. The creature resembled a human, but its limbs were too long and it had horns on its head. Its skin was white, but withered away and covered in blood. I cried out in horror as I looked upon this demonic creature feeding. The creature looked up quickly, bearing long, sharp teeth that still had flesh inside. Not knowing what to do, I quickly aimed the pistol at the creature and fired until it was empty. The creature took a good number of shots, but only reacted to the last one that killed it. The last bullet connected with its horned skull, and it died. The creature began to spasm all over the floor while spewing blood everywhere. As I watched the creature, it slowly changed shape from this grotesque beast to something that began to look more and more human. This made me more afraid to see what now appeared before me was a lifeless man laying on the floor. What just happened? How did it change from this demonic beast to this old looking man? I frantically paced the upstairs not knowing what to do when I heard a sound coming from downstairs. A sound that sounded much like the thing I just killed. I went to lock the upstairs door and right when I did, I heard a loud slam on the other side. The door didn't hold for long when I saw long limbs trying to reach through. I ran to the window and looked down from the second story to see a descent of 15 feet or so. I turned around to see a very similar creature now completely inside the room. My options were to jump from this height or stay and definitely die a violent death. I took my chances from this height and I jumped. The beast seemed preoccupied with whatever it was I just killed upstairs because instead of following me immediately, it waited. I laid in the snow, and thankfully, I was unharmed. I anticipated a violent flurry of limbs coming out of the window, but nothing. I quickly hurried to the only place I thought to be safe, which was the hangar. I reached the hangar and entered quickly. I looked back at the cabin to see the deranged figure standing in the doorway. It was tall, but it was also slim. It stared at me with seething hatred that I could feel radiating off of its evil eyes. The distance between myself and the creature was enough that I could easily enter the hangar before it would reach me, and I took this time to look at it. I felt like I was looking at something that shouldn't exist. It was as if I had entered a dimension that accommodated devilish beasts. The mood of complete adrenaline and fear slowly melted into extreme sadness and sorrow. I could feel myself being overtaken with powerful thoughts of increasing negativity and pain. Somehow at the source of all of this, I knew that this creature was somehow responsible. I entered and closed the hangar door before I became overwhelmed with these feelings. I could feel my grip on reality slightly alter in a way that I have yet to regain to this day. I entered the hangar and started my truck. 
I activated the hangar door and got inside the truck. When the hangar door opened, I saw that the creature had gone and the cabin remained opened. I pulled the truck next to the cabin and listened outside for any signs of that thing. But thankfully, I heard nothing. I decided that instead of going to the next town, I would see if my cabin was cleared and if it was, I'd just stay the night in the cabin. I lost my gun in all of the commotion, but I did arm myself with a large steak knife. I could feel a dark cloud lift from earlier, and I could tell that whatever those two things were, that they were no longer here. I went upstairs to find my room in complete disarray and the door barely hanging on the hinge. There was no sign of the body of the old man. There were stains of blood everywhere and claw marks on the floors and wall. The body of the small moose remained half-eaten in the center of the room as a grim reminder of those hellish beasts. I called the next morning to the nearest police station and reported what I saw. I was transferred a few times until I finally reached the chief of police and he said that he wanted to come personally to my cabin to get more information. The police came later that day and I was forced to stay home rather than go to work. The police came, but when I told them my story of what had happened, they completely dismissed what I said about the beasts and told me that I actually saw a rare breed of bear that lived in the area. This could not have been true. Those creatures had no fur on them, and they had horns or antlers. I was tempted to tell them that I killed one, and that it turned into an old man. But, I was afraid that if I did, they would either think that I was crazy, or that I actually killed someone and used the story to cover it up. Needless to say, the police were no help, and I made arrangements to leave Alaska the following day. I was unable to get a new project manager for my company and ended up outsourcing the responsibility to another company. I have yet to fly again since my old plane was still in that hangar next to the cabin. I don't think I'll ever go back and, considering what I saw, I would say that I'm just lucky to be alive. My name is Brenna, and I work as a paleontologist, which is someone who finds and restores fossils for a living. I really enjoy my job because it allows me to work with limited human interaction, and because I genuinely enjoy finding new fossils. It's like working on an extremely hard puzzle in which you have to find the pieces. I always get a sense of accomplishment when I either put together an incredibly difficult creature, or on the rare occasion when I find a new species. We were called to southern Utah in a remote section of national parks where rock formations and caves are prevalent. This place alone is home to so many unique dinosaur finds which often surprise people. When we go to locations like Utah, I bring a small team with me which is about three people, including myself, and we stay on site. Thankfully, my team consists of another girl named Katie, who is around my age, and an older gentleman that we call Papa John who was in his early 60s. Papa John had been doing this gig longer than me and Katie had been alive. He was super cool to work with and was also a complete stoner, which makes our camping trips all the more enjoyable. When we would take the crib, we'd bring a camper with us and usually just stay in there together. Thankfully, Papa John isn't a creep, but rather a grandfather-like figure which makes sharing the same space for a few weeks bearable. Kitty is like most girls where I'm not. I've been told that I give off a punk vibe, but I don't quite see it. It's probably because of my tattoos. Anyways, back to the story. We had been working on the side of this mountain one day, getting samples for a possible site to find more fossils, when Papa John goes for one of his walks, aka his smoke break. When I say smoke, I don't necessarily mean a cigarette. Instead of old John coming back with blazed eyes and a slight stagger in his step, he comes back, out of breath and with excitement. Katie and I shoot her heads up to see he's holding something. It appears to be a small rock that had been cracked down the middle, encasing the remains of a fossil. Apparently his smoke break actually yielded results to our dig site, and he happened to stumble across a cool find. It wasn't the rock that excited him though, more so where he found the rock. He told us to follow him, which we did confusingly. He took us down this beaten path that lined the base of the mountain. 
the right side of the path had been overgrown with brush and sage, which made going down the path a bit of a squeeze. John was always good about finding good places to smoke so he wouldn't get caught. This was definitely the place to do it. As we continued to press through the intense brush, we eventually arrived at John's prized location, at the base of the mountain. There was a large boulder that appeared to be covering what looked like an entrance to a cave. John was convinced that this cave was sure to have priceless fossils hidden inside. The only problem was that we needed to find a way to move this boulder. John, being old in age and not having any equipment with them, was not able to move the boulder, but he figured that me and Katie with a few pickaxes would be able to chip away the boulder enough for one of us to slip inside. Looking at the truck-sized boulder, this would take us some time. I went back to the RV and grabbed two pickaxes and a shovel, while Katie and John stayed back. We started working on the boulder, but we were only able to work for an hour or two before the sun got too low. We figured that it would be okay to leave our tools here since the area was completely hidden. We were the only ones in the area anyways. We went back to the RV and had our typical evening of having a small dinner and playing cards. John smiled the entire night, ear to ear with excitement. He kept telling us the best finds of his career have always been in areas of shelter, much like a cave. Southern Utah was a hotspot for things like this. The night continued on with high energy and anticipation for what was to come of the cave. There was a good chance that we'd be able to find valuable minerals in there as well, depending on the age of the cave. John woke us up early the next morning with coffee and singing. He was ready to get the day started despite it still being dark outside. Nonetheless, this didn't stop the jolly man from handing us headlamps and skipping down to the cave. Katie and I were not morning people. However, it was hard to stay mad at John for long. We made it back to the entrance of the cave where nothing seemed out of place. Our tools still remained in the same place as well as the menacing boulder that prevented our entry. Katie and I worked at chipping at the sides of the boulder while John dug at its base. The chipping seemed nearly pointless since the progress was so minimal. I was certain that the right people with the right equipment would be able to move this in mere seconds, but time nor money happened to be on our side. About halfway through the day, John was able to dig enough at the base of the boulder to make it shift about a foot. This was just enough to open a small hole near the bottom where the boulder met the cave. Although being a small opening, it was just enough to send one person in without any gear. John was too big and I had claustrophobia, so I definitely wasn't going into the entrance until the hole was bigger. This left it to Katie, who was always up for a challenge. She took off her gear and got on her hands and knees and tried wiggling her way in. She kept her headlamp on from earlier this morning and peered inside. She told us how large the cave was and that we definitely all needed to come in and explore it. We handed her her gear and told her that we'll keep working on the boulder without her while she explored. We told her to be careful and not to get lost. Caves were notorious for people going missing. We worked more on the boulder, which took us some more time. Another hour or two, and we managed to produce another four inches on both sides of the hole. This still wasn't enough for John to fit in, and I still wasn't comfortable trying to squeeze in with this size. We called into the hole for Katie to give us a quick update, but she didn't answer. We figured she was too far into the cave for her to hear us, and we just kept working. We worked a little bit more before John and I decided to take a quick smoke break. I really wasn't one for smoking, but I was tired, and I still needed a break. We just sat off the side of the boulder, and John and I lit a smoke. I drank a Powerade that had been in my bag while downing a cliff bar that had since melted from this morning. I was catching a bit of secondhand smoke from John's weed, and I felt a little lightheaded. John and I were talking about music and other random things when we heard a muffled scream coming from inside the cave. We looked at each other, rather confused, and snapped out of our trance we had. John and I both ran over to the hole and peered inside while shining a flashlight. Katie, are you okay? John's genuinely concerned. However, we got no response, which was rather concerning. John looked to me with shock on his face. We need to open this cave right now, he said. A chill went down my spine when I said I'd go in just to check on her. John looked even more surprised. Bruna, are you sure? You don't have to do this. I know you have claustrophobia. 
We can work on the boulder some more, so you don't feel so claustrophobic. I sized a slightly bigger hole up in my mind, and I figured it was doable. Frankly, this was a lie. I took off my bag and put on my headlamp. The lamp wasn't very bright, but it was better than nothing. I started going in head first, and I worked my way in. The cave immediately opened up once I got a few feet inside, which was reassuring. However, I felt pressure on all sides of my body while pushing through. This triggered my phobia, and I began to slightly panic. I pushed through more hastily and finally made it in without having a full panic attack. I felt proud of myself. I was able to overcome one of my greatest fears that I had in a very much needed situation. I snapped out of my self-congratulations and began my search for Katie. The cave was tall and was somewhat wide, but completely dark save for the small hole of light I just entered from. The hole was able to illuminate about 20 feet or so, but anything beyond that was completely dark. I was able to notice that on the ground were footprints. Footprints who would have had to have been Katie's. This should make finding Katie rather easy for me, since the cave had yet to split in other directions, which caves were known to do. I made sure not to wander too far, yet I kept a watchful eye out for Katie. I called out her name rather loudly, since I had no need to be quiet. I was trying to find someone, so this was the best course of action. My cell phone obviously was not able to work since we were in the cave and it had poor reception. I kept following the footprints which went deeper into the cave. The cave not only went into the mountain, but also on a downward slope. The cave's floor went from dirt to mud, and now to stone which made tracking Katie's prints nearly impossible. I couldn't help but notice the temperature getting slightly more and more cold. This was fine although I wasn't dressed for anything below 70 degrees. I also noticed that my senses were on high alert. I attributed this to my adrenaline pumping from my claustrophobic encounter from earlier. My hair stood on the back of my neck, and I now felt scared. I was deciding if the search would have to wait for John to open the cave more, and he could come inside, and that's when I heard it. That's when I heard a scream. Not Katie's scream, to be exact, but rather, something else. It didn't sound like Katie at all. It sounded like some type of large, predatory animal. I froze in my place, but I then realized that the cave system often had air circulate throughout them, creating strange sounds. I only knew this because I'd worked on an excavation that was once in a cave. The sounds can be terrifying, much like the one I just heard, but when you realize that when air is flowing through jagged rocks, much like the ones that were lining this wall, it makes sense. Essentially, it made the cave a giant death whistle. I was tempted to call out again to Katie, but the gust of wind that resembled a scream had caused me to no longer be as brave. I turned back to check up on John to see what progress he had made, and also to alleviate some nerves that I had recently acquired. Thankfully, I hadn't made it too deep into the cave, so the walk back only took a few minutes. When walking back, I could see the light coming from the hole and movement from outside. Before I was within talking distance, I heard a rock fall deep from within the cave, roughly where I was just standing. Could this be Katie? I stopped in my tracks and looked both ways, back to the entrance and then again to the sound that came from within the darkness. I decided to check in with John to let him know that I was okay and that I thought I heard Katie. I went over to the hole and I noticed that it was much smaller now. My heart sank. There was no way I was going to be able to get through this hole. John, what happened to the hole? I screamed. Sorry, Brenna, he shouted. When I was digging the boulder, it readjusted due to the soft soil. However, I heard Katie on the other side of the boulder. Brenna, I found a way out of there, she exclaimed. You just need to go deeper in and take a left at the large stalactite. From there, you'll be able to hike up and out near the camper. But be careful. I think there's something living inside. My fear became paralyzing. I know that Katie was just trying to help, but... That information absolutely terrified me. I just considered waiting by the entrance until they were able to shift the boulder again, but that could take hours. Plus, I could tell that it was getting dark outside since the light that was coming in was much more dim. My thoughts raced about the gust of wind and the rock that fell from earlier. Hopefully that was the cause for the rock to fall and not some large animal that was going to eat me. I hiked a good ways into the cave, but I'd yet to see any mineral formations that even resembled a stalactite. 
Thankfully, my LED headlamp had fresh batteries from this morning, so I could count on those for a few good hours of light before my light gave out. I walked further in and heard a wind of gust much louder this time. However, it didn't sound like the one from before. This time it had a whistle to it and actually felt the gust of wind. This was both good and bad since whatever I heard earlier might not have been a wind gust. However, this did mean that I was near a cave entrance. I pressed on further into the cave doing my best to stay calm and to find the underground landmark to guide me to the exit. But the further I went, the more I felt despair and hopelessness. I'm not exactly sure if this had anything to do with the cave itself or the looming idea of there being something malicious hiding in its depths. I did my best to try to stay silent so I could try to hear more wind gusts, but also to try to stay concealed in the darkness that surrounded me. Up ahead I heard something. This time it wasn't a gust of wind or a scream from some kind of animal, but rather shuffling as if something was walking on all fours and they were crawling throughout the cave. Not knowing what to do since I had no way to defend myself nor anywhere to really run, I did the only thing I could do in my state of panic, which was to turn off my light. This was a huge risk since most of, if not all animals that inhabit caves have the ability to see in the dark. If this was the case, then turning off my light would only put me at a disadvantage. I had to act fast since whatever was coming at me seemed to be coming quickly. There was a good chance that whatever it was had already seen my light, but I had to try. I turned off my light and held my breath. The shuffling continued up until where I was standing, and it stopped. My heart sank and my blood froze. Something knows that I'm here. Instead of shuffling, I then heard the sound of sniffing coming from a small distance away. It was as if whatever it was knew I was there, but couldn't quite pinpoint exactly. I leaned up against the wall of the cave and ran my hands along the wall, hoping for something to try to climb up onto. I grabbed what felt like a solid hold that could elevate me up a few feet, and I silently started climbing. My feet felt around for any type of support to try to help lift me, but I felt nothing. I then pushed on the wall of the cave with both my feet and pulled myself up using non-existent upper body strength. The hold I was grasping with my shaky hands started to crack and completely disconnected from the wall. I then fell only a few feet, but it was enough to get the attention of whatever was sniffing. By whatever unfortunate circumstances that caused the rock to disconnect from the wall, fate now seemed to somehow be in my favor, as I was now holding a large rock in my hand. Before I could even register the pain from falling for those few feet, I was then grabbed by the creature. To my surprise, I was not met with sharp teeth, but rather, rough textured hands. Something grabbed my legs and let out a scream that resembled the sound I had heard earlier in the cave. My instincts kicked in and I swung the rock that I was holding in the direction of the scream, and instantly connected with soft tissue. But I also heard a cracking sound upon connection, then sobbing sounds. I was confused as I was under the impression I was being attacked by some kind of animal, but it was now crying. Did I just hit someone in the face with a large rock? My adrenaline was at an all-time high and I was very confused. I turned on my headlight not thinking about the situation, and I instantly regretted it. My light shined on what looked like a woman, but her hair was ragged and it covered her face. The woman was wearing pelts of fur from other animals which looked like they were rotting. The woman was clutching her face that was spewing dark red blood profusely. The woman was crouched down which made her seem normal size but when I tried to speak to her and apologize, she glanced over at me through her matted hair and stood up. The woman was grotesquely tall. I was more confused than anything by this. Her arms were long and connected to ungodly looking hands. Her hands had long brown fingernails that resembled claws. The woman was no longer sobbing and she removed her hand from her face, revealing that I had indeed smashed her in the mouth with a rock. Her sobbing turned into rage as she revealed her teeth that were now reddened and broken. My first hit with the rock was a miracle since I'm very uncoordinated. I tried to throw the rock at the woman but I was nowhere near hitting her. I turned and immediately ran. I could hear the woman behind me drop to all fours and begin pursuing me. The adrenaline was able to give me a quick boost of stamina, but it didn't last long. 
I heard the screams coming from behind me, but to my surprise, I also heard distant screams ahead of me. It was as if she was alerting others. As I ran, I then entered what appeared to be a large opening in the cave. To my horror, it revealed a horrific sight of more creatures like the woman. However, they seemed to be eating something and were rather distracted by my entrance. I could see that what they were eating due to the colors of the clothes of the person were bright and recognizable. They were eating Katie. Thankfully, the creatures were preoccupied with their current meal that they seemed to not care that I was in their place. I continued past the small group and pressed on into the cave looking for anything that could get me out of here. The woman, however, continued her pursuit despite being a good distance away. The woman, or should I say creature, was starting to make ground as I began to tire from fatigue. All seemed lost as I didn't really have anywhere to go. There was a good chance that this cave didn't even have another entrance. However, my light then caught a flash of a stalactite that hung right before the entrance of two caves. I remember Katie's instructions to take the cave to the left, which I did. The cave took a sharp left. Thankfully, the advice from Katie seemed to prove useful, as I saw that the cave veered up and to the left. The incline was steep and the ground was wet from moisture. A light current of water came in slowly trickling in on jagged rocks, making my footing very slippery. I was then forced to go on my hands and knees to scale my way up without slipping. The wet rocks also seemed to slow the creature behind me enough to ascend without being attacked. I finally reached the top of the cave and to my delight, it led to another small opening that led outside. Thankfully, it wasn't small enough to trigger my claustrophobia, but I did have to duck to get through. I went outside and saw that the exit was on the side of the mountain that seemed extremely out of the way. It was now nighttime and it was raining. I was able to quickly look around and see her camper a good distance away, and the lights were on. I wasn't sure if the creature was still behind me, but I didn't take any chances. I shuffled down quickly the steep mountain and sometimes having to slide down on my bum, which tore up my pants, but I didn't care at this point. I could now feel the pain of all the scratches and bruises my horrific pursuit had incurred. My hands were cut and my legs ached from the small fall and from all the running. I reached the trailer and fell down while banging on the trailer door. I was met by Papa John and by Katie. I was out of breath and I couldn't say anything for a few seconds. I pointed at Katie in confusion and I tried to explain what I saw in the cave. They were eating her. Katie and John both looked at each other and grinned at me with a wide smiles revealing long, sharp teeth. Both then started to convulse and shake wildly, shifting into those creatures from inside the cave. They both grabbed me and rather than kill me right then and there, they began to drag me back into the cave. My dad died last year in a car wreck, which was a terrible tragedy. I was in my late 20s and I'm an only child, so I inherited a large portion of his inheritance. My grief-stricken mother received his life insurance and warned me to be smart with the money. I was working as a car cleaner at a local dealership, which paid barely more than minimum wage. I had gone to college but dropped out due to partying too much and sloughing on my grades. I was never one for school. I always thought it was for suckers that didn't know how the real world works. You didn't need to know how to use the Pythagorean theorem to start a company, or to buy a house. Anyways, I've always had plans to start my own company. I follow a bunch of people on social media that have these rental properties and timeshares and make tons of money off of them. I figured that that's how I could actually make money and invest. Now was the time to do that. At first, I considered investing into crypto or random stocks like Tesla, but I figured that rental properties were the way to go. That even if no one were to rent them, I could at least live in them for a time being. I searched the local real estate listings for great properties that I could rent, but I was looking for quantity, not quality. Everything I was looking at at the time would run me dry, and I wouldn't even get two properties out of it. I needed something more off the grid. Something I could buy cheap and build multiple units. I was driving late one night and I noticed on the outskirts of town that there was a large property with old rundown homes on it. There were about three homes with a trailer and other stuff on the property. I pulled off to the side of the road and got out to see if there was any listing for the property since it looked like no one lived there. It was around one in the morning or so and there weren't any lights coming from inside any of the homes so I figured that jumping the fence and taking a quick look would be fine. 
The fence was an old rusted barbed wire fence that had tons of slack on it, so I was able to easily step over it. I walked quickly with my smartphone out and turned on my flashlight feature. The more I walked onto the property, the more I saw trash and other garbage lying around. I noticed that there were two old looking cars that were around the late 1970s with rusted frames and non-existent glass in any of the windows. They were parked next to this old trailer that was missing a door. I skipped over the trailer since I was not interested in it and would end up throwing it out anyways if I was given the chance. I took a quick look at the outside of the house, or what was left of the house, and knew right away that I wouldn't be able to use them since they were structurally unsound. However, despite not wanting to keep the house, curiosity did get the better of me, and rather than just accepting the house as being unsafe, I decided to take a look inside. The interior was equally unimpressive as it revealed a ruin result of a decaying home. At first glance, the walls were lined with graffiti, and the floors were covered with trash. However, there was something off about the graffiti on the walls that began to give me a sense of dread. Normally, graffiti is random ramblings of curse words, slurs, and your occasional outlines of obscene images. However, this graffiti looked different. The markings on the wall looked more coordinated in terms of color and in style of images. After closely shining my smartphone's light upon the dirty brown walls, I then realized that the markings were symbols, all with different colors and shades of red. Some markings looked newer than others. I didn't want to say that the symbols were letters, but they were unlike anything I'd ever seen. Amongst the symbols were also very grotesque depictions of stick figures being subjected to what I can only describe as some type of evil force that would either torture or consume the stick figures in some way. These depictions also followed the same style that the symbols were drawn, as if the symbols and the drawings were all from the same source. After seeing no more than a few minutes of what I can only imagine to be mad rantings of an extremely disturbed person, I decided that what I was seeing was enough for me to leave. However, I was also compelled by a completely morbid sight of me to take photos of these images, mainly to try to see if I could find the meaning of any of this on the internet. As I was taking photos and slowly making my way out of the home, I noticed that the symbols led me to a doorway that had a set of stairs going downwards. On the doorway, however, was written a word that I did understand. A word that both disturbed me, but also grabbed my attention in a way that I couldn't turn down, despite how terrifying it may have been. The word was... Hell. My body was telling me that there were unspeakable horrors awaiting me in the darkness that laid beneath, but my mind was all too curious. I shined my phone's light down the half dozen wooden steps and saw that the writings continued. My step on the stair let out a creak that shook every bone in my body. It was as if I was awakening the devil himself. I held my breath as I continued down, knowing fully well that I already made enough noise to alert anyone of my presence here. My descent down was exponentially worse. There was no moonlight coming in from broken windows to supplement additional light like it did upstairs. This basement carried a fog of darkness and an ever so slight tinge of hopelessness. The basement reeked of death and decay that smothered you like a dirty blanket that you couldn't remove. I could feel myself losing my mental fortitude, as if I would be enslaved to this basement forever. I reached the bottom of the stairs and, either out of habit or for a cry for help, I tried the light switch that laid at the bottom of the stairs. To my shock and pleasant surprise, the basement imperfectly illuminated a dirty yellow glow casting undeserved light on the wretched filth that inhabited the basement. The only light bulb that lit up the basement was next to another doorway in the corner of the basement. I could see old furniture covered with black mold and mounds of what looked like wet carpet in the middle of the floor. I noticed despite the mess that the floor in the middle had more writings, except these looked much more different than the ones upstairs. These looked like symbols from upstairs, but they were neat and organized in what appeared to be a perfect circle. I was preoccupied with the symbols on the floor and the light being inadequate for basic vision that I didn't realize that the wet mound of carpet that laid in the center of the circle was actually decayed flesh of an assortment of animals. That is, until my flashlight better illuminated the horrors before me. At that very moment, my eye caught movement ever so slightly coming from the doorway next to the light. I didn't see a demon or a serial killer with a hockey mask. 
What I did see was a long protruding arm reaching towards the single bare light bulb, grasping it with impossibly long fingers, and crushing the bulb and the only other light source besides my pitiful phone. The bulb made a loud popping sound, causing me to jump and drop my phone into the mound of flash. Thankfully, my phone landed downwards where the light on the back was still able to cast light upwards. I didn't bother going for my phone at all, but rather, I ran through the basement, up the stairs, and out of the house. The next thing I knew, I was outside and out of breath. I'm not entirely sure if I was followed or not, but nonetheless, the experience was one I never forget. I jogged back to my car, looking back at the home that hid those horrors beyond my imagination, half expecting to see some ungodly creature crawl out after me, but nothing. I stood half terrorized, yet also confused. Is it possible that I imagined that? Not the writings or the mounds of flesh, but the arm. The basement was dark and I couldn't see that well. Well, regardless, there was no amount of money that could have been offered for me to go back into that basement to retrieve my cell phone. Needless to say, I was no longer interested in this property. After two months of, and I quote, structural management, the nameless organization finally decided to reopen the national park in the early winter months. They hoped that, since most people do not visit this particular park during the winter, that this would give the forest rangers enough time to get the park back in working order. This would require a remodel of the forest station and a resupply of the resources needed. They had to rehire a completely new staff under the direction of the nameless organization. They didn't want word to spread of what had happened earlier, and they didn't want word to get out into the public. For those wondering, the United States government does not recognize nor acknowledge the existence of beings or entities that cannot be explained by modern science. They are either classified as ongoing classification or as an unknown threat. The first day of opening, the unnamed organization brought in a mixture of both forest rangers and military personnel. The military personnel were to stand guard of the workers remodeling the forest station, as well as to accompany the rangers on their tasks. The forest rangers were to visit campsites as well as the facilities nearby and make sure that they were in working order. Both groups were unaware of what had happened previously at this park, thus they were confused at the level of security that was required to operate this location. Jason, a forest ranger that had transferred recently, joined the morning meeting that assembled outside of the forest station. Both the forest rangers and the military were mingling amongst themselves. Two black SUVs pulled into the parking lot, 20 feet away. A man dressed in a nice suit, accompanied by two men carrying machine guns, exited the vehicle and walked over to the groups. The entire group hushed down to a low whisper as the man in the suit introduced himself. Good morning. You may address me as Director Borsky. I have been assigned over this park. What we will be doing is rebuilding and fortifying this park here. It is very important to the United States government that this is done quickly and without delay. I have four rules for all those that are assigned under my authority. Number one, no one is to be out past dark. Number two, you will have a companion with you at all times. Number three, do not use the military-issued road that leads into the park. And finally, no one is to speak to the public about what happens here. Any questions? The crowd remained silent since no one wanted to be the fool to ask. The director looked around and saw that no one raised their hands. Great, we're on the same page. The military is assigned here as a training simulation. The director and his two colleagues spoke to different department heads of the forest rangers in the military before leaving. We kind of stood around aimlessly while they were talking since no one was giving direction. That quickly changed when the director was done talking to the department heads. Once the director left, we were all paired into groups. I was paired with another forest ranger named Jackson, and two military personnel named Nathan and Andrew. Off the bat, Jackson introduced himself to the group. He was in his late 40s and gave off a cowboy vibe. Nathan was newly enlisted, and you could tell he was a frat boy. Andrew was more of a family man that was serving his country out of duty. Despite the wide variety of personalities, I felt lucky to be in this group. 
Nothing is worse than being stuck with some hard noses. We were also given walkie-talkies so that we could communicate to the different groups. We were assigned to check on the furthest campsite that was across the park. It would require us to take a service truck and drive 40 minutes. Thankfully at this time, the thick morning fog had rolled away and the overall visibility was tolerable. As we drove, I got to know Nathan, the military guy, very well. We sat in the truck bed, while Jackson and Andrew sat in the front. They seemed to get along fine. Nathan showed me his issued weapon, which I thought was interesting. I thought that they normally issued some sort of rifle. However, they gave Nathan a shotgun with dragon breath rounds. This seemed out of the ordinary, but I was new, so I guess I didn't know what was normal. We arrived at the campsite at the back of the park. Everything looked like it had been there for months, which was actually the case. There were small amounts of trash scattered, but nothing unusual. We worked our way back and checked in on random campsites. Most campsites looked normal, while others looked like they were scorched by some kind of fire. The ground and nearby trees were black and gray. All of us got out of the truck and investigated the campsite. It was cold out, but there wasn't any snow on the ground yet. This area is very wet all year round, so to see it completely burned definitely didn't make any sense. It looked as if multiple people took flamethrowers and burned the camp. Jackson, the cowboy-like ranger, squatted down and touched the ground. You know, the odd thing about the char is, it only looks like it's covering the campground. He looked around as if he was uneasy. Something doesn't add up. Why do you military boys paired up with us? Nathan shot me a glance, and I smiled. Great. We got a conspiracy theorist in the group, I thought to myself. Andrew remained quiet, but also scanned the tree line with Jackson. We got back in the truck and drove back to the ranger station. Considerable progress had been made on the remodel of the station, but was still incomplete. It was midday and we had food brought to us from the nearest town. After an hour of eating and laughing, all the assigned pairs went back out to finish their duties. Nothing happened that day, or at least no one said anything. At the end of the day, all the groups were assigned certain locations in the park that were close by to sleep in. They were either these heavy-duty trailers or located in one of the fire towers in the park. My group got lucky, and we were assigned a trailer. We were given a strict curfew from 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. Under no circumstances were we allowed to be outside when it was dark. Thankfully, the trailer that we were assigned to was nearby other trailers and had cable. It was a bit awkward having four grown men share a somewhat rather close space. Jackson was fine as long as he wasn't talking about his conspiracy theories. Andrew barely said anything, and Nathan and I were basically old friends at this point. Night came, but we were already inside. Thankfully, it was early winter, and we still had sports to watch. The night went on, and the evening was uneventful. We certainly appreciated the curfew and slept in till 8 a.m. for the first time in a while. We met up at the forest station that was still being worked on. They told us it would take us another two or three weeks to get the station ready to house us again. During the morning assembly, we were reminded to stay indoors during curfew. There were reports of people being seen outside in the woods that were unaccompanied. Nathan and I locked eyes. Who would do that, I thought. Our group was assigned to stay and guard the forest station for the day, which was easy enough. We just sat around talking with the other groups and watched the construction company slowly change the forest station more into a base. There was a light snow in the air, but nothing stuck. Jackson started talking to the other groups and asked them if they believed in Bigfoot or something ridiculous. The more I was around Andrew, the more I realized that he was socially awkward, but he was becoming more comfortable around us. Nathan and I were talking when another group's truck came barreling into the area and parked outside the station. Instinctively, all the guys in my group grabbed their weapons and walked over to the truck. In the bed of the truck appeared to be two rangers applying pressure to the neck of an army man. His throat was bleeding profusely. From my first aid training, I already knew that he was a goner. The forest ranger department had made his way over and walkied in support from the unnamed organization. He was barely alive when they finally arrived, but all the blood from his face had been drained. Nathan and I looked at each other in horror after seeing what we just saw. 
The first ranger department had told us that the man was injured would be taken to the nearest hospital, but that they did get the bleeding to stop. That event made the rest of the day go by slower, but it also put everyone on edge. All the personnel were coming up with theories on what had happened to the poor man. Jackson's theory was that one of his group members slit his throat, which was obviously ridiculous. Other more reasonable ideas that were floating around was that a mountain lion was trying to land one last hunt before hibernation. Mountain lions were quite frequent in the area and extremely quiet when stalking prey. Night eventually came and the ranger station was still being modified. We had dinner and went inside before it got dark. All the department heads made final stops at all the trailers and fire towers to make sure that everyone was inside. We were all on edge with what had happened earlier. However, little did we know what horrors laid before us in the coming days. It was later at night when our walkie-talkie buzzed us awake. It was a group stationed in the fire tower on the other side of the park. Come in, this is fire station two. Is there anyone on our stairs? Being annoyed by being woken up, Jackson got up and turned off the walkie-talkie. Andrew asked, What if that's important? Jackson said, It can wait till morning. Ain't nothing else out here but us and them animals. I sided with Jackson and I went back to bed. The next morning we woke up and got prepared like normal. We made our way to the forest station and we saw that everyone there was conversing amongst themselves but were trying to be discreet as if they were trying to talk and not be suspected. I asked the group next to me what was going on, and they act shocked. Didn't you hear what happened last night on the walkie-talkie? I had a vague memory, but shook my head no. No, what happened? We turned it off. The guy in the group was about to say something to me, but the forest ranger department had interrupted and started the morning meeting. The head ranger told us what goals he had for us for that day. He also said that there were events that unfolded the night before that were currently being investigated. If you see anything weird, be sure to report it immediately to either department head. I was dying to know what had happened the night before, but no one would tell me after the meeting. Nathan was able to get some information from his military buddies. Apparently the group in the fire tower went missing. Everyone was on edge in our group, especially Jackson. The whole day, Jackson had his gun with him. We made sure to stick together, even when we went into town to get supplies. The forest had changed that day, not just because what had happened in the fire tower, but we could feel an odd sense of something now lurking in the forest. We also got faint smells of something rotting from time to time, especially towards the latter part of the day. We considered at one point to search for the source of the smell, but Jackson told us that it was the sign of something unearthly walking towards us. I was going to criticize him, but a part of me felt like he was right. The day was ending, and we were trying to install some lights at this pavilion on the other side of the park. We let time get away from us, and the next thing that we knew, it was starting to get dark. This wasn't an issue since we'd be able to drive back in about 30 minutes, but it'd be close. We entered our vehicle and started to drive quickly. The visibility was low and was only getting worse by the minute. We hit an unexpected bump in the road. We hit the bump so hard that Nathan and I hit our heads on the roof of the truck. As we kept driving, it said that the truck had low coolant. It was getting darker and we tried to continue on our way, but the truck sputtered to a stop about 10 minutes away from our trailer. We all looked at one another with wide eyes. We aren't going to make it back before it got dark. Jackson, being the self-proclaimed leader, told us to hop out of the truck and to start walking back. Seeing that we were too afraid to argue and to find another solution, we followed Jackson. It was dark and about five minutes into our hike. The intense smell came back and I was beginning to feel what I can only explain as lingering death slowly filling my mind. We had flashlights in hand as we continued on the gravel road leading us back to camp. Andrew was in the back of the group, but I could see his flashlight. It would frequently shine behind us, as if he was looking for something. At one point, we heard some rustling coming from the trees behind us, and everyone stopped to look. All of our lights were shining in a similar area where we thought we heard something. 
Jackson snapped us out of our daze, and we kept hiking back. We were almost back when we began to hear a blood-curdling scream coming from behind us. A scream that was both terrifying, yet so human. This gave the group the needed motivation to sprint back to camp without stopping. The men forced their way into the trailer and quickly locked it. The feeling of dread and the horrendous smell had long left their senses, but their adrenaline was in full swing. It took them a minute or two before they realized that the close group of four was now down to three. Andrew, who was in the back of the group, was not inside. He must have been left behind. The group considered their options. Do they stay inside as instructed, or go back out into the danger and try to find Andrew? Nathan got on the walkie and asked his department head what to do. They responded with, You are ordered to stay inside. It is dark and no longer safe for you. Do not open the door for Andrew until the morning. That's an order. The group fell silent and stood there horrified. I spoke up and said, We can't just leave him here out all night. No one said anything. I knew that they were thinking the same thing as I did, but they didn't want to disobey orders. We sat there in silence and slowly thought about what we were going to do. Looks like Andrew would be spending the night outside. Later that night, when we were all in our own beds, not quite asleep, when we started to smell the same smell of death, I perked up and looked around. Our trailer had small windows on certain sections of the trailer. I got up and peered outside, but I couldn't see anything. It was far too dark, but I could see that it started to snow. Nathan saw that I was up and was looking out the window, and asked me what I was doing. I told him that I maybe thought Andrew would have came back by now, and I was looking for him. At that moment, our walkies came on. Jackson, there's someone outside your trailer. Do not open the door. Jackson creeped out of bed, rubbing his eyes, and walked over to the walkie. What was that? asked Jackson. There's someone outside your trailer. Stay away from the doors. Yeah. That's probably our guy, Andrew. We lost him in the woods today, Jackson said annoyingly. Jackson walked over to the door and peered out the window. Jackson peered out, confused for a minute or two. Despite the orders, Jackson opened the door and went outside. Nathan and I looked at each other with complete horror as we saw that he left the door open. We both had the same thought to run after Jackson but we stopped at the doorframe. We saw that Jackson was only a few feet out, but he was barely visible. The walkie blared on again, telling us to get back inside. Jackson quickly turned around, ran back inside, and locked the door. We need to barricade the door, Jackson whispered. We started to move our beds and heavy furniture in front of the door, and right when we did, we heard a bang on the door. It was loud and barely shook the door, but it was enough to give us all a scare. What did he see? whispered Nathan. Jackson shook his head and said that he thought he saw a young woman crying. But when he went outside, he noticed that her face looked extremely old and decaying, like that of a corpse. She started to twitch and shake when she noticed me. The bangs on the door were getting louder and harder. The walkie blared on again. Guy, there's more coming to you. We're going to try to assist you. We heard more banging on the door, and the frame started to crack. Not much later, we heard the fire of automatic weapons outside. We could hear some bullets hitting our trailer. To our horror, we began to hear screams that weren't human. Banging on the door stopped briefly, and the gunfire continued. We laid on the floor, hoping that the bullets hitting our trailer would miss us. The walkie blared on again. The bullets aren't doing anything. Get back inside. The gunfire eventually stopped, but the screeching continued. We could tell that there started to be human screams from time to time. We walked over asking what was happening, but no response. Things went eerily calm. The smell was thick in the air of dread and decay. We continued to lay on the floor out of fear if we made a sound, it would draw those things back to us. Despite us being silent, the banging began on the door again. Nathan got up and grabbed his shotgun, and I grabbed my service pistol. I could see out the window, quick movements of shadows blur past us. They continued banging on the door, and the frame started to give. 
the door was about to give at any moment. I aimed my pistol at the door's window, where I could see matted hair, and I fired. Whatever was out there started screeching, but the banging continued. The top hinge completely broke, and part of the door had opened. Nathan fired his dragon breath rounds at the creatures, and they caught fire. To our surprise, the one figure that caught fire immediately fled. The screeching was more intense. Nathan fired again at the next creature. This creature made it halfway inside, but caught fire, and tried to turn around and run out into the snow. There were so many creatures pushing it inside, that all it could do was flounder around until it laid lifeless on top of the broken door. Fire seemed to be the only thing that damaged these creatures. Nathan was the only one with dragon breath rounds. Jackson and I tried shooting at these things, but they were not even phased. The creatures finally broke down the door, and we could see what we were up against. These creatures were tall and lanky. Each one looked to be unearthly, but slightly human at the same time. Nathan continued to fire at the creatures. Each one he hit caught fire, and they ran outside. Despite this new discovery, the creatures were too many and were likely going to overpower us. We heard more gunfire from outside. We assumed it was backup. Some of the creatures went outside while others kept coming in. One snatched Jason with its talent-filled hands and pressed him against the wall. Blood gushed everywhere as Jackson squirmed helplessly. Nathan fired at the creature pinning Jackson, and the creature caught fire. Unlike the other creatures, this one continued to attack Jackson, slashing at him with his free hand. A man with a hazmat suit entered the trailer carrying a flamethrower and igniting both the creature and Jackson. The creature was much more responsive to this and dropped to the ground. Jackson laid lifeless on the ground as his body smoldered to a crisp char. The man in the hazmat suit aimed the flamethrower at me and Nathan. Name and rank, the man shouted. Nathan and I were both quick to respond. The man in the hazmat suit hesitated for a few seconds, but eventually lowered his weapon. You'll need to come with me. The man in the hazmat suit walked outside to where there were dozens of people in hazmat suits. They were all carrying flamethrowers fighting these creatures that were coming in from all sides of the woods. There were four unmarked vans, one of which he guided us to. Nathan and I entered and the hazmat suit guy got in. He placed the flamethrower on the passenger seat and started driving. The hazmat guy got us out of there and started driving to the forest station that was still unfinished. We drove past it and continued to the military highway road that we were forbidden to be on. The road was still in the park area and was surrounded by woods. The night was dark and the snow rarely began to come down. The man driving was clearly panicked as he went faster than what we considered safe for snowy conditions. While we were driving, Nathan checked his shotgun. He noticed he only had two dragon breath shells left. The highway took us to the part of the park where we've never been before. The terrain became more rugged and mountainous. Everything was unfamiliar. The headlights beamed ahead and caught what appeared to be one of those creatures in the middle of the road. The man driving slammed on his brakes, but the conditions were so bad that he lost control. The vehicle hit the creature head-on, but drove off the road and into the trees. Nathan and I were launched forward, slamming us violently into the seats in front of us. The creature was pinned between the unmarked van and the trees ahead, but continued to twitch slowly. The driver was unresponsive. The flamethrower was leaking fluid all over the seat. Nathan and I were dazed from the crash and slowly stumbled from the van. Nathan kept his shotgun, but I had lost my service pistol in the crash. I considered grabbing the flamethrower, but I saw that it was unsafe to use. There we were, just off this super restricted road that we should not have been on. To make matters worse, we were in the middle of the woods. We finally decided that our best bet was to continue on the restricted road and hoped it led us to someplace safe. I was lucky enough to still be wearing my ranger uniform, and I had my flashlight in my pocket, which I took out and turned on. We could hear in the distance screeches and screams. We needed to hurry. We continued down the road for a ways when we saw a flashlight ahead. It was flashing as if someone was turning it on and off, as if to signal us. 
We sprinted forward to find Andrew standing in the middle of the road. He looked rough, but still alive. We were so glad to see him, we didn't even think to ask what had happened to him earlier. Andrew looked at us with this empty stare. He noticed Nathan's shotgun. Andrew seemed to be looking at us, as if he was trying to size us up, as if he hadn't seen us in weeks. Does that gun shoot fire? Andrew asked. It was such a weird question, but we didn't know Andrew that well. Like I said earlier, I thought Andrew was socially awkward. He was always so quiet and hardly spoke. Nathan shook his head. They hate fire, Andrew said coldly without looking away from the shotgun. Look, we think to stay on the road is the best bet. Are you coming with us? I asked Andrew. The question snapped Andrew out of his trance and he nodded. I'll follow you, he said softly. We continued down the road for a ways. The snow got heavier. After 30 minutes of walking, the road then took a surprising turn to a tunnel that led into the hills. My heart sank as our only safe option would be to walk through this dark tunnel. Nathan led the way and I shined my light ahead of him to help him see. He had his shotgun ready and aimed as he walked. We walked into the tunnel that seemed to be well maintained. We continued in the dark tunnel until we couldn't see the entrance anymore. My dim flashlight sent small scattered beams of light in front of us. As we walked, we heard sprinting coming from the front of us. My flashlight had yet to detect anything coming when suddenly a figure appeared and attacked Nathan. Nathan, being caught by surprise, accidentally fired around, missing the figure and illuminating the tunnel for a brief moment. The figure was now on top of Nathan and beating him with his fists. Instinctively, I jumped on the figure and got him off Nathan. All the while, Andrew watched us fight. After a few seconds of chaos, we were able to find the figure that attacked us. It was Andrew. Not the Andrew behind us, but there was another Andrew. There were two Andrews. The Andrew that attacked us told us that he thought we were one of those things. He then realized that there was another him, and he told us to shoot the other Andrew. The Andrew behind us got defensive and told us that he knew it was us, and he still attacked us. He was clearly a creature. Nathan swiveled his gun from one Andrew to the next, back and forth, debating on which one to shoot. Which one do I shoot, Jason? They both look the same! The two Andrews were now yelling at each other. They both looked identical. They were shoving each other so much that we got them mixed up. We had no idea which one was which. Nathan whispered to me, Dude, I only have one shot. Which one do I shoot? He said, panicking. One of the Andrews said, Just shoot us both. That's the only way to be sure. Nathan then swiveled the shotgun over to the other Andrew, who started to protest, and shot. Flames erupted from the shotgun as the pellets clearly hit its target. Screams erupted from Andrew, but they were not like the screeches from before. He ignited into flames and lit up some of the tunnel. He fell to the ground without flailing. The other Andrew began to cackle a hideous laugh and transformed into this disgusting beast with twisted limbs and sharp teeth. Nathan knew right then and there he had picked the wrong Andrew. The creature imitating Andrew immediately attacked Nathan and began to eat him alive. The glow of the computer screen distributed an uneven glow across the darkness that filled the home office. Zack worked hard on his company project as he played Deftones on his AirPods, and taking an occasional hit from his vape while also checking the time. Despite the room being nearly dark except for the half dozen devices used to help Zack work, it was nearly 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Zack preferred to work in complete darkness to help unload his senses and to better immerse himself in his work. Zack was 37 and divorced. He had two children which both needed to be picked up from soccer practice at 6 p.m. He had to force himself to check the time or his work would inevitably consume him and they'd get left behind. Zack used to work for the NSA as a security programmer, the opposite of a hacker, but 
After the high stress nature of the job and the relatively low pay, he found it best to freelance his abilities to companies that paid more for less work. Zack was also a hacker in his free time, which was essentially all the time now. He would mainly wander the dark web and interact with political activists and find dirt on government officials. Having worked for the NSA and seen what the iniquities the government had committed, Zack felt that it was his duty to bring to light their wrongdoings, although in a more inconspicuous way than Edward Snowden. Zack also had $7 million in various cryptocurrencies, which made it difficult to stick his neck out for the common people since he had so much to lose. A random leak of information here, or an anonymous tip to random news outlets there, was all he did. He laid out the breadcrumbs and let the journalists do the rest. However, they seldomly ever did investigate the tips sent in to really make a difference. I looked down at my analog wristwatch to see that it was now 5.27pm. I began shutting down what I was working on to see that I just received an email. Normally, emails don't bother me, especially if I was in a rush, but this one did. First off, it was sent to my private email, which is something I don't give out, but also what the email contained. The email was a link to a website that had the phrase, The Real Truth, as the subject heading. There was no return email address. I stood mystified, only for a few seconds before returning to my task of breaking down my workstation and getting out the door. On the way out, I grabbed an energy drink and two Powerades from the fridge and left the house. I physically locked the front door rather than using Siri or Alexa. Being a hacker and a programmer, I knew better than to purposely place those devices that anyone could essentially access and do who knows what to my house. Once outside, I soon realized that the weather was no longer sunny, but a light rain had begun to fall. Seeing how I was already running late, I shot down the brief thought to grab a light sweater and just toughed it out of my 9 inch nails t-shirt and cargo shorts. I entered my 1997 Toyota Camry and fired it up. Despite being worth millions, I had yet to talk myself into spending it on a vehicle. I liked the Camrys because it lacked any sophisticated computer system like a Tesla that could be used to track me down or shut off my car, but it also gave my ex-wife the impression that I didn't have any money. Also Camrys just happened to be great cars. I eventually pulled into the soccer complex and saw that practice was just now getting out. I debated on whether to check my emails as I waited for my two children on my cell phone, but I made it a personal rule to never check my secure email on my cell for obvious reasons. The phrase, the real truth, kept echoing in my mind. Was it some kind of political smear document of misaligned funds or something exposing underground organizations that were conducting nefarious acts beneath our noses. You'd be surprised at the kind of information that was out there in the public record that people simply do not search, either out of complacency or simple ignorance. Unfortunately, in my field, I have been exposed to those things that have been kept away from the general public, and for good reason. Some of the stuff that still keeps me up at night the real truth is probably some kind of knockoff global warming campaign that wants me to donate money or something, and I'm just overthinking it. Before I allow my mind to wander any further down this ambiguous rabbit hole, a loud slap on my driver's side window pulled me back into reality. It was my oldest child, Kyle, slapping the window to let me know that the car was locked. The light drizzle had picked up since I had arrived to the soccer complex, and it was raining more heavily. I unlocked my car and popped open the trunk in hopes that my children had common sense to put their muddy equipment in the back, but I guess that common sense is rare these days. Both my children entered the car and placed their dirty bags in my rear seats. My thoughts of deep contemplation had now shifted to annoyance. I yelled at them to at least close the trunk, and the youngest one finally jumped out to complete the simple task, but not without complaining the whole time. The drive back to their mother's house was equally as annoying as well. I try to stay involved with the children, but they show little interest in interacting with their biological father. To be fair, I understand, with all that I put them through, but I still want to be a part of their lives. The drive in the dismal conditions to their mother's house had been uneventful. 
when I pulled in, I could see that Roger's car was in the driveway. My ex-wife's boyfriend. Normally when I pick up the kids, I go in and at least say hello, but today I decided with the rain and with Roger there that I would be okay without talking to the ex. Both children exited the vehicle and said thank you for the ride, which, which I appreciated. I began my drive home in the now darkening twilight, the rain coming down much heavier than before. I made sure to drive carefully as I couldn't remember the last time I had replaced the tires. I'm sure the traction wasn't great. I pulled into my home and fired up the workstation again. This would take a few minutes as I used multiple devices. As that was warming up, I threw some food into the microwave and put on a show. I grabbed a cold beer from the fridge and began my lonesome meal in front of my TV. I finished up my meal and made my way back to the workstation and set up the conditions to my liking. I checked my emails first thing to see what updates I had. This normally notified me of my cryptocurrency or any other updates that I had, but there remained that mysterious email titled, The Real Truth. Being a hacker and a programmer, I knew better than to click on something that had no return address. However, whether it was due to a mouse slip or perhaps just me having one too many beers for dinner, I found myself clicking on the email. The email didn't contain many words other than the subject heading on the pictures. There were many pictures, most of which seemed to be in people in hazmat suits, cleaning up random scenes in laboratories. Other images contained very graphic scenes of mutilated people. These images were quite disturbing, even for someone like me. Despite the complete chaos from the horrific images, it appeared that these victims, for a lack of a better word, were arranged in a way that confused me. It was as if some demented modern artist had carefully placed these corpses in a manner that almost seemed to mean something. The setting for these images slowly changed from what looked like a contained facility to now urban areas, like campsites and even remote cabins. Some pictures had titles or captions like, They don't like fire, stay in the light, and don't listen to the voices, while others had numbers associated with them which I soon found to be coordinates. I opened another tab on my desktop and entered the coordinates in a secure browser on Tor. There was no reason for this level of security, but I was always someone to err on the side of caution. At first, these coordinates didn't seem to pull up any significant locations. Most of these locations seemed to be on private land, out in the middle of nowhere. However, I was able to find that one of these areas was connected to a highway system and was definitely accessible to the public. As I looked into this more, I soon realized that it appeared that the government was trying to cover this up. It would appear that there was some kind of creature inhabiting these wood areas. I would even dare to say with all the pictures of the facilities that the government at one point had captured one of them. However, it's hard to tell considering that the pictures weren't very clear. And other than the pictures, I wasn't given much information. With everything that I'd been given, I decided to package all of this up into a nice email which I sent anonymously to the city's news station. I tried searching on the dark web and even reverse Google image search the pictures, but I couldn't find anything. These pictures appeared to be original. In the past, having leaked information to various news outlets, only two times have anyone actually responded. The two times were from the same reporter named Rebecca Johnson of Channel 5 News. She was young but aggressive in her reporting. There was a time in which she actually used one of my leaks to catch the mayor having an affair with his secretary. She was obviously a choice for me to send this information to seeing how she actually used my leaks and how she was a go-getter. I was actually excited to see what she'd come up with, with all the information that I gave her. I was rather curious about what was going on, more so who had sent the email to me and why. But also, I was also intrigued to see what Rebecca would come up with. After a week of leaking this information to Rebecca, I got a response saying that she was able to uncover that the coordinates led deep inside a national park that was actually roped off with police tape. She tried to get more access, but the rangers there stopped her, saying that they were working on construction for a new road going through the park, and that no one from the public was allowed inside. She mentioned in her email that it wasn't construction tape or signs, but rather 
actual police tape, and biochemical signs. She said that she knew that they were hiding something, but, but just didn't know what. She was allowed to wander the rest of the park and even camp if she wanted to, but obviously she was only interested in what they were hiding. I didn't think much of the email, and I didn't even think to respond, considering it didn't confirm nor deny anything. But it didn't make me wonder who had sent me the email with those pictures. The person had clearly had access to what was going on. I went out of town that upcoming weekend to go visit a friend when I got a call from my ex-wife. I stared at the phone as it rang in my hand. I told her to only call me if it was an emergency. However, she called me before for said emergencies and it happened to be just something dramatic at work and unrelated to me. It made me kind of happy that she still wanted to talk to me, but it also made me upset considering her past. I decided not to answer the phone and let it go to voicemail. While out of town, I briefly continued my investigation and I reevaluated my email on my personal laptop. I considered posting on the dark web to see if anyone else had any more information on the subject, but seeing how this could be a threatening situation if I was found probing, I decided to keep all this information to myself and not to post it online. Rebecca Johnson was the only person I trusted with this subject. The weekend went by quickly and I checked my personal email to see what updates I had, and it looked like Rebecca had emailed me about 10 times. Each email was an update on the development of the story and what she uncovered. The first couple of emails had images of various campsites that looked to be roped off by caution tape. However, the photos seemed to be taken at night. The crime scenes didn't reveal much at first other than torn tents and a few abandoned camping trailers. However, things began to get weirder as the photos then began to show images of just the woods. She added in with a few photos how she felt at night and that she kept hearing random screams in the distance. It was as if Rebecca was randomly taking photos at night with her flash on, as if she was using the flash to illuminate her way through the woods. That is, until I saw one photo that seemed to really bother me. I saw what appeared to be a person, however the distance and the poor lighting couldn't identify whether it was male or female. But I could see that whoever it was, wasn't wearing any clothing. There appeared to be a black stain around the neck area. That was an obvious sign for concern, but there was no information given on this photo. The last photo of the email showed a large and rather ominous looking tunnel that looked to go inside the side of a mountain. Rebecca added to the last email how she had seen multiple military vehicles enter this tunnel and that she felt that there were answers to be found inside. The last email was sent Sunday morning at 2.57 a.m. The emails from Rebecca had abruptly stopped and I would go a whole week without hearing from her. All I could really do, other than going down to the location I had sent her, was to wait for more updates. Things got interesting three days later when I got another anonymous email without a return address. There had been a handful of times where I had felt completely terrified and helpless. Little did I know that. That email I was about to open would completely shatter any past experiences and scare me to a level I had never felt. The email was simple, but it scared me psychologically. There were photos of Rebecca tied down in some kind of lab with some type of creature next to her. That was the only photo that I could recognize Rebecca in. The rest of the photos were blurry, yet I was able to make out parts of the images having blood and flesh tossed carelessly around the lab. The subject heading for the email simply put, Stop. Looking. I stood up from my chair, as it was obvious that whoever sent me the initial email was not the same person that sent me this one. The first email felt like an invitation to further understand the evils taking place at this facility, while this most recent email was definitely a threat. I received another email almost immediately after this one, which was equally as disturbing. Rather than my information being listed, it was my ex-wife and my children, their names, addresses, places of occupation, and etc. However, there was a slight mix-up with this information. They called me Richard, who was obviously my ex-wife's current boyfriend. Apparently, when they tried to dox me, they looked at my old IP address, not my new one. 
It now looked like Richard was now on the hook for what I had been investigating. At first, I saw this as being rather fortuitous, since they had the wrong man, but it also scared me that my ex-wife and children were now involved. I still loved them, even though I was no longer a reliable role model for them, and only saw them seldomly. I immediately tried calling my wife to which it rang a few times until it went to voicemail. I called her three more times to the same effect. I even tried calling both my children, but no answer. It was clear that what had happened, and I couldn't just sit on the sidelines in this situation, but rather try my best to somehow recover them. I drove by their house to see if they were there. Both my wife and her boyfriend's car were there. I tried knocking on the door, but no answer. At this point, I had to assume the worst. At this point, I finally decided that I had to investigate myself. When I was in the NSA, I was required to take a firearms training, which was some time ago. I still had various weapons from the time working there, including some black market weapons as well. I still had my old body armor from the training, but that was definitely out of date since I got the armor about 10 years ago. I went back to my house and loaded up the Camry with my weapons and ammo while wearing my body armor. I plugged in the coordinates that I'd sent to Rebecca and started driving to the National Park where all of this was taking place. The National Park was about six hours away, which would mean that I would arrive at the park in the cover of night. This actually worked out well considering my plan was to park at the campsite and hike my way down to the tunnel. My six-hour drive was filled with the fear and anxiety, not necessarily for myself, but rather my family. I felt like my life was in between the states of not caring and oblivion. I had no real meaning for something until now. I must save them. After the long drive, I finally arrived at the National Park around 9 at night. This was due to having to stop a couple of times to fuel up and multiple attempts to still contact any family members. The front gates to the park were abandoned. There were no personnel there, which was good and bad. I drove into the park and was surprised by the thick layer of fog that covered the trees around me. It made visibility incredibly low. I exited my car with my machine gun around my shoulder. I stayed on the main paved path that led deep into the park, half expecting for rangers to come and stop me, but no one ever did. However, my feeling of anxiety and fear began to multiply as I heard what sounded like gunfire coming a good distance away in front of me. I pressed on in hopes that I could step off the path and hide if things got out of hand. After a solid 30 minutes of hiking and hearing gunfire, I then was able to see light coming from what looked like a couple of industrial trailers, much like the ones you see at mining operations, or any remotely located company. I stayed my distance as I didn't want to get involved. I was unsure who was firing at what and I felt that regardless of who found me, I was good as dead. I had to remain unseen whether by the creatures or by the rangers. I crept up on the slight hill overlooking the trailers and saw that there was quite the battle going on, but the rangers were clearly outnumbered. There only seemed to be one trailer actively firing at the beast trying to come inside. My help from the hillside would prove to be useless as I could tell that the standard ammo that they were using was not that effective. When all hope seemed to be lost and by some miracle, a small group of rangers somehow made it out of the trailer and into a cargo van. The cargo van was able to pull out of the area and onto the highway that ran down the middle of the national park. All the creatures that were trying to enter the trailer had now began to follow the cargo van and leaving the area. This was my way in, I thought. I need to go down there and investigate the area and see if just maybe they left behind any type of gear that would be helpful. I left the little comfort that the shadows and the solitude that that hill had and entered what felt like a war zone. There were small fires scattered across the area that looked to be what remained of some unlucky creatures. I scanned the area for any sign of life, but there seemed to be none. In that area, there appeared to be several different dressed people. One said I was able to recognize as four strangers, while others were dressed in hazmat suits. I wasn't sure what the hazmat people's role were in the area. Perhaps there was some kind of disease or hazardous material in the area. There was an abundance of material left behind. 
which I took advantage of and replaced my gear with. I was now wearing proper body armor, and I even found a spare hazmat suit that I instinctively put on. This was to protect myself, but also to conceal my identity if I were to encounter anyone that was still alive. The area had a few cargo vans that still seemed to be in working order. I just needed to find the keys. I checked inside and whether by poor maintenance or by sheer chaos, the keys were still in the ignition. I quickly jumped in and started the cargo van. This seemed to have alerted something to my presence. As the cargo van fired up, I began to hear screaming coming not too far away, most likely in one of those trailers I purposely avoided. I didn't stay to see what came out, but rather took off the same road that the other cargo van took in hopes to find the tunnel of some kind. That's all I had to go off of. I drove the cargo van not too far when I saw what appeared to be a crash. It was the same cargo van I just saw leave and there were some creatures surrounding it. The creatures appeared to be some kind of hybrid human wolf thing. They stood upright and had normal limbs of a person, however their features were off. I didn't get a great look at them since my instincts told me to hit them with the van. I veered the van in their direction in which I sent a handful of the creatures flying. I kept going forward when I finally arrived at what appeared to be the same tunnel that Rebecca had shown me in her emails. I drove into the tunnel slowly. The tunnel was not illuminated in any way, and I had to go off of the headlights of the van. I didn't get too far into the tunnel when I saw what looked to be two people fighting. One looked like a ranger fighting on the ground with what looked like another ranger on top, but something was off. I noticed that the person on top was bleeding profusely, but the blood looked to be black. I kept the cargo van aligned with the scuffle in front of me. While exiting, I remembered that those creatures didn't like fire. A brief search in the rear of the cargo van revealed a flamethrower alongside other materials like flares, medical supplies, and etc. I grabbed the flamethrower and a flare and ignited the flare and tossed it in the direction of the fighting. I approached the two people and threatened both with the flamethrower if they didn't stop. The person on top didn't seem to care that I was even there and kept screeching like those creatures I saw earlier. Seeing clearly that the person on top was one of them, I ignited the creature with the flamethrower. Not having ever used a flamethrower before, I ignited both people on accident. The creature on top jumped up and ran down the tunnel while changing its form from a person to this ungodly creature before collapsing. The person on bottom I accidentally lit on fire only had part of themselves ignited, which made it easy for me to quickly put out. The person I was helping screamed, but it sounded more natural. Well as natural as a person being on fire. After about 10 seconds, the fire went out, and the person seemed to only sustain small burns. Thank you, said the ranger, to which I nodded. My name is Andrew. We need to get out of here, he said exhaustedly. Hello, Andrew, I responded. I agree. However, I am looking for answers. I think that those creatures in this tunnel are somehow connected. I don't know for sure, but I think the people in charge of this place have my family. Andrew stared at me with wide eyes. Do you know anything about this place, or can you assist me in any way? I asked sincerely. Andrew took a minute before hesitantly nodding. I don't know anything about this place, but I am willing to help you since you saved me. I let out a sigh of relief and helped Andrew up. His arms and part of his torso were burned, but after a quick bandaging of gauze, he seemed to be okay. Andrew and I both hopped in the van and continued down the tunnel. We came across small embers of the creature I had just recently ignited not too long ago. The creature was lifeless and a small amount of smoke continued to come from the lifeless corpse. We pressed on not too further when we saw something that surprised us. In the middle of the tunnel wasn't some kind of horrific monster or hive of creatures, but rather a military-grade tank next to a large door. The tank illuminated the tunnel with a spotlight, and we could hear as we approached people speaking to us over a megaphone. They instructed us to go to the decontamination area up ahead for inspection. We both looked at each other as we were confused. I slowly drove forward and followed the instructions. Upon exiting, we were swarmed with more people in hazmat suits, which, which tackled poor Andrew to the ground. I was still wearing my hazmat suit, and they seemed to ignore me. 
it was pretty clear that the ranger was not authorized to be in this area of the park. They apprehended Andrew and placed him on a stretcher and cuffed him to it. He looked at me with confusion, but I couldn't break my cover. They pushed Andrew inside and I followed inconspicuously, as if I were to be one of them. Things began to get weirder. Upon entering the facility, I was astonished to see inside was some kind of horrific lab. It wasn't a military base, but rather some kind of research center. And the surprises only got worse when I saw various types of people. Some were in hazmat suits, while others were in white lab coats. They even had heavy security, wearing military-grade armor. But alongside those people were what I can only describe to be as greys. Greys are a type of alien race that, for one, are grey, but also a type of alien that is often depicted for human abduction. I had seen files of them before on the dark web of greys walking amongst the human population, but I had no idea that they were working with us. I tried to act natural in this setting, but it was difficult. I needed not to draw any attention to myself and to try to get some answers. I also tried to keep Andrew safe, but I had no loyalty to him. I needed to find my family. I figured, wherever they're going to take him, there would also be my family. I tried to remain calm while following where they were taking Andrew. However, I didn't get too far when a gray, for whatever reason, began to point at me. I didn't have time to react as my body began to be paralyzed by some kind of force. I fell to the ground as a man in a suit walked over to me while slowly clapping. Bravo, Zack. I didn't think you'd get this far. I couldn't move, but I was aware of everything that was going on. The Grey seemed to be using some kind of paralyzing force, causing me to not move. The man in the suit knelt down next to me, and I could see his security badge with his last name. Borsky. You know, Zack, someone like you with your kind of skills can never really retire, especially after what you know. I'm quite disappointed that you got Rebecca involved. She was close. You're probably wondering what we're doing here. Why we created those things, well, it comes down to this, Zack. The world is no longer ours. Us humans have lost the battle to the Greys, and we, a select few people in the government, are in charge of reducing the population. The Greys are sophisticated. They don't want to reduce our resources with fighting or war, but rather a more casual takeover. A takeover that doesn't destroy the world that they're trying to capture. We figured the best way to do that is to release the perfect weapon, which we find to be skinwalkers. Funny enough, the Greys have a similar monster on their planet. Well, I suppose their monster is a little more complicated. Anyways, I don't know why I'm telling you all this. The security detail picked me up and placed me on a stretcher while cuffing me to it. Borsky walked over and patted my chest. Oh, and uh, don't worry about your family. It won't matter soon anyways. You know, Zack, I'm really glad... You got my email.